Happy Friday, everyone. You know what that means? Another live lawn care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your lawn care questions. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. Super happy to have you here. The way this works is really simple. On your screen, you're gonna see a chat box. In that chat box, you can enter your question, concern, comment of the day, and I work through them in the order that they come in. Now, sometimes I have the answers, sometimes I do not, but either way, either way, we have a great time talking about lawn care and sometimes life. Guys, you'll have to excuse my voice uh, this evening. I'm fighting a bit of a cold, um, but it's getting better. Good thing it happened. Um, you know, the worst part of it was a few days ago, but I'm still not back 100%. So hopefully you guys will be able to put up with my, my scratchy voice and the occasional coughing. Hopefully everyone is doing well tonight. As always, we're coming to you guys live on YouTube as our primary platform. We're also streaming on Instagram and um, Facebook tonight. Twitter, again, it is acting up. So you guys just have to make do. And the theme for tonight's show is about feeding that green. You know, I've got some really cool pictures from various viewers showing the states of their lawns coming out of dormancy. So I want to share those with you guys tonight, show you guys a picture of um, some pictures of my lawn, as well as give you a little tour of how the differences are between the front and rear lawn and how they're greening up differently. And just talk about strategies for you getting ahead of the competition, getting your lawn looking its absolute best as you have the goal of dominating in the 2024 lawn care season, right? All right, so let's jump right back into it. Those that are um, here on the gram, feel free to chime in and I will, um, I'll get to rope your questions in as well. You're just not gonna be able to see anything that I share on the screen. Um, okay, Lawn Guy says, how long is the show? As long as it needs to be. Uh, normally we go for a couple of hours, just depends on how many questions I get and I just, I keep going until I run out of questions. So it can be an hour, could be mm, sometimes almost four. But I don't think it'll be that long tonight. We'll see. All right. So hang around if you if you um, if you have something. You just step away for a minute. I'll probably still be here when you get back. All right. So our first question of the evening comes from Julius Elias. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's about things that something that I enjoy. Plant growth regulator. 
So Julius has a question. He says, can I use Nutrizolve liquid soil micronutrient with 2% iron mix along with Primo Max growth regulator? Can I mix and spray them together? Absolutely, Julius. Um, it's a great idea. Um, adding a little bit of iron uh, in with your plant growth regulator applications um, can, especially at least for the initial one, initial application of the season, can help prevent um, tip burn, a little temporary yellowing you can get. Um, my combination that I will typically spray will be Primo Max, um, the 901C carbon kit, and a bit of Nutrizol. So I'll show you what I'm talking about here. If you go to the golf course lawn store, you go to shop in the lawn fertilizer section. My stack includes Primo, obviously. And then the 901C version of the Golf Horse Lawn Carbon Kit, which is 901C, Nutri Kelp and Biospectrum. And then the product you asked about, which is Nutrizolve, all of that goes in the tank and gets sprayed at the um, at the same time. Works, works great. Um, what I'm also going to share with you is a blog post on the strategy that I use for, for spraying plant growth regulator that allows you to get all the benefits with really none of the downsides. So I'll share that here for you here in the chat, and uh, and hopefully you get some um, some some value out of it. Um, the the big thing, the big difference that you'll get out of this this blog post when you take a, when you get a chance to take a look at it, is that um, instead of spraying Primo at the full rate once per month, because if you read the label, it'll say you know this it'll be X number of ounces per thousand square feet for you know per month on on these types of grasses. So instead of doing that, what I like to do is is take that monthly rate and divide it in half and spray every two weeks. That way, for one, you 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 have a pretty um, low chance of getting any kind of tip burn the first time you um, introduce growth regulator for the season. You don't um, have to worry about it, um, like the the springboard effect where the lawn, the grass comes out of germination, you get a big flush of growth. So there's there's tons of benefits. And if you're out there anyway, like how I am, because I spoon feed my lawns where I spray liquids every couple of weeks, it all just kind of makes sense for me. So I'm going to send you that blog post on plant growth regulator on the strategy that I like to use um, for for spraying it and to answer your question yes so you can absolutely use Nutrizolve there's no um there's no weird interactions or anything you need to be concerned about again I, I spray it every every two weeks so uh so yeah so you got some some fun reading if you're interested in that as well and the nice thing about that blog is towards the bottom there's a section that talks about um that talks about uh the rates because some of the, one of the questions I've gotten is is actually I'll just show you real quick so this is what you're going to get I just linked it there in the chat um, it's on how plant growth regulation can make your lawn thicker and greener. And down here, um, menu item three talks about tip burn, what causes it. And then I supply um, half rates for common grass types. So if you decide you're going to go do this, um, you know, it makes the math a little bit easier. If you have Bermuda grass, it's super easy. For most, for most hybrid um, Bermudas, um, the rate that's recommended on the label for Primo Max is a quarter of an ounce. So the low end quarter of an ounce all the way up to just under 0 0.40 ounces per thousand square feet. So if you think about that, if you have a four gallon backpack sprayer, if you're spraying it only once per month, which I'm not telling you to do, but say you're only spraying it once per month with a four gallon sprayer, 0.25 times four would equal one ounce, right? So if you're doing what I recommend, which is to not do that and spray it every two weeks, you're going to be spraying half an ounce, you'd be putting half an ounce of Primo Max in four gallons of water and spraying that every two weeks. And conveniently, the Primo Max um, bottle has a measuring cup on it. And you can see right there, there's a marking for half an ounce. So this actually would be, let's say I were spraying Primo this weekend. I'm not, but let's say if I were, that is the amount of Primo that I would use in four gallons of water. And I'd spray that every uh, every couple of weeks. So Hope that helps. Great, uh, great question. Again, there's the one thing I'll tell you about plant growth regulator is there is life before it and there's life after it. It is one of the coolest tools um, in your lawn care program, especially if you are real mowing or you just, um, you know, you're, 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 you have more sh um, shortcut turf. There's tons of benefits to it outside of just reduced mowing. It you know, helps with the hardiness of the turf. So, uh, so yeah, I hopefully that was enough info for you to, to get started. And if you are looking for the link to where you can find all those products I was talking about to include Nutrizolve and everything else, you can find them here. So there you go, at Julius, and there's the link to the products I was talking about. All right, before we get too further down the road, let us take care of our show sponsor of the evening, which is Mr. Archie Amos. Super chat received. Archies are calling out LG saying, stop hiding and raise me. Well, thank you so much, Archie. Really do appreciate all the love and support. We, uh, you know, you're, you're a constant, um, you know, constant person that's on the show and it really means a lot you show up every Friday and take some time out of your schedule to come hang out and listen to me uh, jibber jabber on about turf grass. So there you go. Your name in lights for whatever that means to you. And perhaps 
you'll be able to summon LG. All right. All right, so moving on to our next question. I think I got something here from, from uh, the gram. Let's say, okay, long guy, all right. Um, he says, so Nephis has a question. He says, hey, Ron, if I'm looking to push my Bermuda into bare spots, should I use PGR to get, to help continue the spread creep? Um, you know, what I would say, um, Nephis, is if you're looking to, to get Bermuda to fill in faster in bare spots, depending on the size, um, just simply plug, transfer plugs into, <clears throat> into those bare areas of the lawn that will, um, into those bare spots, that's going to um, allow it to spread from the outside, from the grass that's touching it, and then also from the inside. It's going to help it to fill in faster. As far as you using growth regulator, you can do that. It's not really going to, um, it's not going to negatively impact it. I mean, the thing you'll find is once we get more temperature, so more heat and um, more sunlight, that's going to really allow the Bermuda to take off. So, uh, so I really wouldn't worry about it too much. If it's a bigger area, consider transfer some plugs in there because that's going to help it's going to give you more points for the for the Bermuda to grow from. But then, you know, I imagine by, depending on how large it is again, by May, late May, early June, you should be looking pretty good. So I uh, so hope that helps. And then um, um, Oki Lawn says, I'm still in the window to overseed my fescue lawn. Um, that's a good question. So I, that's one I'd have to bounce off the uh, off of um, Devin. I'm not sure if he's here tonight. Um, the big thing... The big thing he um, he spoke about is that you you know the 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 label the bag that you, for the grass seed you're going to be using will have guidance as far as what temperatures as far as soil temperatures you want to aim for for seeding it. So as long as you follow that and you water properly, you should get a good result. Okay, uh, next up is Mr. Brian Tanner. He says Happy Friday. Looking forward to some turf talk this evening. Well, we will get some of that. That's definitely going to happen, Brian. And the next up is Brian Tanner. He has another question. He says. Happy, um, since I joined the Academy 10 days late from when I needed to, I put down my first stress blend uh, FERT. Would it be okay to flip them around and do granulars on the 15th of the month and liquids on the 1st? Yeah, you could. I mean, the big thing is granulars every, you know, every 30 days. So once, once every four weeks or so, you're going to put down a granular fertilizer and then the liquids will be on that same day and again on, on, the, um, on the 15th, so 15 days later. So let's say, for example, you were starting, you were going to do the spoon feeding program, right, Brian? You would, um, and we're starting, say, April 1st. You would do your, your stress blend app um, your fertilizer app on the first of the month, and then on that same day, you would you do your liquid spray, and then 15 days later, you would do another liquid spray. If you were starting it now, so because today is March 15th, if you want to do your granular fert app on the 15th of every month, that's fine. It, that doesn't really change anything as far as your liquid app. You would still do that. You would still do your sprays every two weeks. So the grass doesn't know what time of the month it is. It doesn't know you know whether it's the first or the 15th. As long as the intervals are correct, you're going to get a good result. So... Good stuff. Uh, thank you for joining the Academy. I really do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully that helps um, helps get you squared away as far as um, your fertilization schedule. If you have any questions, of course, you know, feel free to drop them in the in the Facebook group. Um, the guys and gals in there are super, super responsive. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get you all squared away. So again, uh, hope that helps. All right, next up, we got Ravi Patel. He says, hey, Ron, hope you're doing well. Eh, hang in there, man. A little bit of a cold, but, you know, I'll survive. I'm here. He says, uh, I wanted to know what's a good fertilizer for Bermuda grass as well as St. Augustine. There's several. So if you're trying to be as correct as possible, um, Ravi, what you would do is you would get a soil test, get a soil test, and that's going to tell you what the nutrient deficiencies are in your soil so that you are applying a fertilizer that is, is that matches what your, your lawn needs. Um, the big thing that I look for in most soil test results is, is if a lawn or if a soil needs phosphorus or not. So to give you an idea, is, uh, if you were to come to Golf Course Lawn Store, go to the lawn fertilizer section, if your lawn or your soil needed phosphorus, then the complete um, 14714, which has phosphorus, would be a good choice. If you don't need that, then Humic Max is what I would run throughout most of the season. So the way I can just break these out for you guys really quickly. The way I use these, these fertilizers on my particular lawn is I rarely use the complete 14714 because I don't really have a phosphorus problem in my, in my soil. I start the season with 12024 and then I will transition to Humic Max. So for example, I've already put this down um, the beginning of, of March and then starting next month all the way through until September timeframe, every month it's gonna be Humic Max. So either one of these are an excellent choice. 
if your lawn, if your soil needs phosphorus, then I would um, go with the complete 14714 because it has that. Um, but any of these are great for both Bermuda grass, for St. Augustine grass. It even, they'll even work on cool season grasses, I'm told. So yeah, all grass types will work fine and, uh, and hope that helps, Robbie. But the thing I'd encourage you to do is if you don't know, if you want it to be as correct as possible, get a soil test. I um, mean, it takes literally from the time you get the, t the test kits to the time you get your results, it's typically less than a week. And uh, that way you'll know exactly which fertilizer is the best fit for your particular soil. So hope that helps. Um, if you are, in, if you're interested, I'll send you two things. I'm gonna send you the link to the, um, where the fertilizers are. And then I'm also gonna send you a link to where you can pick up a soil test kit if you decide to go that route, which is what I would recommend if you're really trying to do things um, as correctly as possible. <clears throat> All right. Next up is Mr. Jason uh, Harrison. He says, uh, happy Friday. I'll have to catch the replay tomorrow, but I wanted to make sure I stopped by to press the like button ever so gently. No worries, Jason. Um, I'm glad that you stopped in just to say hey. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'm sure you'll be able to catch it on the, uh, on the replay tomorrow. Guys, we got 123 people in here, only 44 likes. Surely we could do better than that. If you guys are want an easy way, a free way to support the channel, support the content, hit that like button. It costs absolutely nothing. And it's a great way to send good vibes to YouTube to get more folks to come over here and uh, and hang out for some Friday night turf talk. Uh, Jackie Burr's up next is Happy Friday uh, live stream, everybody. Thanks so much, Jackie. So guys, I'm gonna take a second here to show you guys um, some of the lawns that uh, some people have sent in. Um, I've got some lawns from from uh, from Oliver, from Tom Hoffenkamp. I'll also show you guys the current state of my lawn, the front and the back. So from one of the viewers, a common, uh, a common viewer on the live stream is Tom. He's out of California, and he's showing his green up. You can see that's looking pretty good, man. I mean, that's that's way past the green fuzz phase. He's looking looking good. And then I've got another one here from Oliver. If you guys remember, Oliver was on the live stream, I think it was either last week, I think he had the question there last week or the week before, about um, scalping height. So he's showing this week how far the lawn has come in just a week from scalping. You see that green is coming in really nicely, which is uh, looking, looking solid, sir. Nicely done. And then my lawn at the current state taken this afternoon before the live stream is looking like that. That's how my front lawn is looking. So the front lawn, um, in uh, because of the way the sun goes over um, my house, the front lawn tends to get more sunlight this time of year, or, or when the sun goes lower in the sky, the, the front lawn gets more sunlight than the, than the back does, which is why it tends to green up sooner. But if you guys wanna see how the entire lawn is looking, let's go for a ride. All right, so as I showed you guys, this is the, the front lawn. And the vanity strip is on point, popping, colors coming in nicely. Alex's lawn is starting to wake up too. And we'll walk around to the back lawn. You can see like this area here on the left, like that is angled away from where the sun tends to be in the evening. So that's gonna take the longest to green up. Um, here on the left side of the swale, which I'm pointing to, you're seeing that's greening up because that is basically pointing at where the sun is um, later on in the day. And you can see the green is coming through. I still got that dormant stripe action coming on. Um, but over on the right side of the lawn, the way my lawn greens up is tends to be from the right side to the left side, because right here, there's a channel between my house and my neighbor's house where a lot of sunlight tends to stay hit throughout most of the day. So it greens up here first, and then it then it spreads to the uh, to the left side. So that is the current state of the lawn as of this afternoon. So if you guys want to say how the lawn's looking, you can see the front's looking awesome. The back is trying to catch up, and it will. You just have to give it some time. All right, next up is Archie Amos. Archie, thank you again for the, for the show sponsorship. You said you want to come in and offer your sponsorship. Thank you so much. Next up, we got Mr. Leo Garcia from Austin, Texas saying hello. And then is R. Reed saying, long time, Ron. Here we are again, a new season, wishing everyone a smooth, sweet, green season. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? And then next up is um, Michael Raymond. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. I've been following uh, you for a while. Your Bermuda looks great. Ever thought about stepping up to Zoysia? Stepping it up to Zoysia? That's that, that kind of like, that would mean that you're saying that the Bermuda is, is less than. Um, you know, I've considered it at some point, um, Michael, but the thing is, I, I mean, it, one, I've got like almost 12,000 square feet that I'd have to get rid, like kill off and then resod with Zoysia. And I do kind of like my, my Bermuda plot. I do have a little bit of Zoysia um, on the property though. I've got one little spot. If you guys ever watched the, the the little planter that I have on the the, the table whenever I'm doing um, videos, that's the zoysia. That is um, compadre zoysia, and you can see it is also trying to wake up. You know, 
I got to give it a scalp. I didn't scalp it. So it probably would have woken up a little bit sooner, but you can see it is also trying to come out of dormancy to look its absolute best when it's in the videos as the prop there showing, hey, you know, I'm not only about Bermuda grass, I got some love for the zoysia as well too. It's just too much, it'd be too much um, headache in my opinion at this point, um, Michael. Um, I thought about doing maybe just the front lawn, but given that the way our lawns are done, they they touch, it's like what's gonna happen is my lawn is either gonna spread in, or the zoysia would either spread into my neighbor's lawn or his Bermuda would spread into mine and it'd be a constant thing. So I just, it's it's honestly, one of the situations of, of it's not broke, don't uh, don't fix it. So I got a little bit though, right? I mean, I got, you know, I don't know, what is that? One square foot of zoysia. So I got a little something. That counts for something, right? All right, next up is Steven Thompson. He says, uh, what's going on, Vron? If we have some poa in the yard, what temps does it usually start dying off without using any herbicides? Um, I can't wait to get my revolution and upgrade um, from the manual reel. That's a good question, Tom. Um, Stephen. Um, normally in May, like mid-May to June, is when you'll start seeing poanua begin dying off as as it gets as temperatures get hotter. So if you didn't want to have to spray it out, um, then you can just wait. You know, but some most a lot of people just don't like the way the seed heads look in the lawn because because um, poa looks quite a bit different from Bermuda, especially when it's flowering, especially when it's throwing off seed heads. So if you wanna get it gone and you got warm season grass, use certainty. If you um, or just wanna wait it out, it's gonna be about probably two months from from today till you start seeing um, temperatures where they need to be for it to begin for it to begin dying off, at least here in Georgia. It depends on where you are in the country. But um, mid, mid May is when it begins to go away on its own um, around here. Uh, so hope that helps. And you so you can't wait to get your revolution to upgrade from the manual reel. I think it should be soon. From what I understand, the mowers are on their way. They're already, they've been on the water. So I'd imagine like later on this month, end of this month is when you, I mean, you guys should start getting them. I mean, you know as much as I know. Um, I'm sure Lee and the team at Real Rollers will keep you guys updated. But uh, but yeah, I know that they are they are on, they are en route. You guys should be getting them um, any, any minute now. All right, so we have the Lawn Mower Dan from the UK. He says, UK ba fan back to watch another live cast. You know what, dude? Respect, because it's 7.20 p.m. here. So if you're in the UK, you're what, five hours? It's after midnight. Um, I appreciate you. He says, we've had the wettest February on record and it's rolling into March here in the UK. Uh, however, I see the little patch in February and it has finally germinated. We're almost there to full on mow season. Very, very cool. That's dedication. And again, thank you so much for, for taking some time to hang out on a uh, on a Friday night. Oh, so it's only so four hours ahead. So it's oh, that's right, because we jumped forward an hour. That's right, daylight saving time. We jumped forward an hour. Um, so twenty. So it's eleven nineteen. Okay, cool. Very 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 good. I think you guys will go forward either this weekend or next, right? And then it'll be the the five hour spread again. But uh, but yeah. At any rate, thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show. I uh, appreciate you staying up super late to come watch it watch it live. It means a lot. All right, next up is Greg Anderson. Great question from him. He says, do I need to aerate and overseed every year? You know, Greg, you didn't tell me what kind of grass you have. Um, the answer to one of those, as far as need, no. Um, I am a fan of aerating annually because of the benefits that you get from doing so. You know, it opens up the soil. It helps relieve compaction. It allows air, water, and nutrient to get into the soil. So it's a good thing to do um, regardless of your, your grass type. Overseeding, it really depends on what kind of lawn you have. If you have a cool season lawn and it's a little bit thin where you've got some damage from the winter, then yeah, overseeding can be something you can do uh, this time of year. But if you don't need it, if you don't need to overseed, then I would say no. Reason being is that if you really wanna get the best possible result from overseeding, you're, you're going to delay or not use pre-emergent, which is gonna introduce another host of problems because you're gonna be more likely to have weeds in your lawn. So if you don't need to overseed, I wouldn't do that. Um, of those two, aeration is the thing that I would say. Yes, you know, lawns would most lawns will benefit from an annual aeration if um, if you can you can find the time to to go out and do it. So great question. Hopefully that is uh, is useful for you, sir. And um, and yeah, I mean, if if you need to overseed, go for it. But I mean, by by deciding to overseed, essentially you are um, able by deciding to overseed, and if you really want it to work well you are not gonna use pre-emergent, which means you're you're kind of resigning that you're gonna have to control weeds um, either through manual means, you're gonna be digging them out, or you're gonna be um, you know going after them with post-emergent herbicides after the fact. So so that's that's my uh, my thoughts on it. 
All right, next up is um, Jimmy Miller. He says, looks like everyone is coming down with the green fever. It's coming, man. I mean, everyone, I mean, come on, man. It's, it's go time. It's go time here in the Southeast. Lawns are waking up. The green is coming in. It is time. It is time. You know what I mean? So it should be, um, should be good. Uh, Robert Rainey is in the house. This is a uh, good evening. Um, everyone, are any of you watching the Players' Championship? I am not. I have not, I have not been, um, been watching. I've not been following you. I'm not sure who's doing well. Uh, so... No, unfortunately, Robert, no. Maybe this weekend. Uh, maybe this weekend. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, throw it on because there's no Formula One this weekend. So I'll, um, I can watch some, some nice turf grass. Be like, ooh, it's pretty, you know? It's a thing. All right, next up is Brandon Kennedy. He has a comment. He says, power rake versus D Thatcher. Have you used a power rake? And if so, what was your experience? Yet, yeah, Brandon, so it's a great question. So of those two, power rake or scarifying or turf raking is what I, I call it, is less aggressive than dethatching. Uh, turf raking or power raking is something that I do regularly on my lawn when throughout the growing season. So really, um, more than a few times a month, I'll go out and I'll, I'll do that. Um, and then as far as dethatching, meaning using like the, the solid blade, like, like the hooked end, it's more aggressive. I don't do that to my lawn because most lawns don't really need it in my opinion. I mean, if you can, you can regularly turf rake to help remove debris and, 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 you know, thatch or any other, other kind of buildup you have in your, in your, um, in your lawn, I think that's really good enough. Um, the only other thing I do other than power raking or turf raking is verticutting. So starting in the end of May, I will verticut my lawn once a month and then power raking uh, several times throughout the month. Now, the, as far as the, the, you're asking as far as the benefits, my experience, um, I mean, love the results. I'll, I'll tell you, if you've watched my channel for any period of time, go back and start watching from like, um, when did I get the outlet? 2022, I think, maybe? 2022? Whatever I got, I think it was 2022. Go back and look at my content from like 2021 and earlier, and you'll see how the lawn looked, which again, great looking lawn, great looking Santa turf grass. Um, but from the time I got the Allet, the C27, where I could regularly turf rake the lawn and verticut the lawn, like the difference in just the quality, the color, um, the stripes, it's just been, it's been another level. For example, um, if you look at um, the back lawn, let's see if I can fast forward, that's not it. Let me if I can fast forward to this, through this video and get to the, to the good part. Um, let me get this off here. Um, if you look at the way these stripes look on the back lawn, like they never looked like that before I was, um, I, I did the other cultural practices of turf raking, verticutting. So the nice thing is whenever I, I do um, turf rake the lawn, I do so um, along the same patterns that I mow it. So the light pattern that you see in front of you right now, that's me turf raking away from the patio and the dark, the dark ones are me turf raking towards it. So I turf rake and also verticut and the same patterns that I mow the lawn, and it just creates, I mean, it creates stripes that are just insane. Like if you look at the intro video for this live stream, um, towards the very end before I start talking, like that result, the lawn never looked like that prior to um, to um, introducing those cultural practices. Now, I'm making it sound like it's all, you know, all um, rainbows and sunshine. What are, the, what are the things you should be cognizant of to get a good result if you decide to do this? The mistake that a lot of people make whenever they turf rake, um, is they tend to go too aggressive. So if you're gonna be turf raking a, a grass type like Bermuda, um, you really wanna set the turf rake up to where it doesn't get into the soil. Like if it's if you are if you look down at the soil and you're seeing marks, it's too aggressive. So um, I set my my turf rake up to where it's um, the tines, the spring-loaded fingers um, are about two to four millimeters above the surface. That does a great job setting the stripes, getting debris out, and just you get all the benefits. There's really none of the downsides. Um, so just so that we're, we're talking about the same thing here, I'm going to show you what I'm referring to when I say, well, this is what I'm talking about when I say verticutting. So this is the verticutter. This is the actual unit that's on my mower that I used to verticut with. And then um, as far as um, scarifying the turf rake, this is what I'm talking about. So you can see this is a lot more gentle. These are spring loaded and these, they gently go down into the canopy, remove debris, remove clippings. Just, they just do a great job of, of really setting the stripe and just keeping debris out of the lawn. This I do a few times per month. Um, the verticutter, this gets run on the lawn once per month and a dethatcher, which um, I don't even have a picture to show you one of those. I think um, in their home mowers, they have those. 
I can show you the dethatcher. I I think I've used a dethatcher on my lawn one time and never again. I mean, they just do, they're just, they're just far too aggressive. So if you look at a dethatcher, you're talking about solid blades, they're spaced a lot further apart. We got, they're almost like hooks. Um, and as far as aggressiveness, like it just tends to tear at the turf more so, the turf more so than, than gently remove debris, which is what you're after whenever you are turf raking. So you can get a great result doing it if you do it properly. The big thing is, is just not to go too aggressive. And then I, I find it gets a great result. And again, if you, if you want to see what I'm talking about, I mean, you can hear me talk about it, but the proof's in the pudding. I mean, literally go look at videos of my lawn from again, from a few years ago, and then look at recent videos in the past couple of years. And the difference, the biggest, the biggest difference is the, um, the cultural practices, is the verticutting and the turf raking. I mean, I've, I've made some, some tweaks in the nutrient program here and there, but the biggest difference as far as appearance has been introducing that. So if you want to give it a go, I would say by all means, go for it. Just don't go too aggressive. Just, you know, it, less, less is, is more when it comes to doing that. All right, next up is Jerry Espinoza. He says, I purchased Turfplex Nutrizolve and Release Zero. It's a good combination, I like it. What rate should I apply? Bermuda grass, and should I purchase Biospectrum? Thanks, Ron. Great, so if you're gonna be doing those, it's a great combination, I've actually sprayed it myself multiple times. If you're gonna be doing um, those for Turfplex, if you get your pen and paper out, Turfplex, you're gonna be applying that at six ounces per thousand. Uh, Nutrizolve, um, the label calls for six ounces per thousand, but because we're mixing it with Turfplex, we're gonna back that down because um, Turfplex has some iron in it. It has some iron and I think mag magnesium in it. It has some of the micros that are in Nutrizolve. So we're gonna do Nutrizolve at three ounces per thousand, release zero, three ounces per thousand. And would I add Biospectrum? Yes, that's that's what I do. I, I would absolutely do that. So again, to recap, Turfplex, six ounces per thousand, um, Nutrizolve, three ounces per thousand, and release zero, three ounces per thousand. And uh, you're gonna get a good result with that. So if you're spraying, you know, 4,000 square feet, you got a four gallon backpack sprayer, take those numbers and just multiply them by four. So it'd be 24, uh, 24, 12, 12, and then a teaspoon of, of uh, Biospectrum suspended in water and off you go. The only thing you're missing is I add a little bit of Primo to the tank, but that's just me, that's just me. So hope that helps, sir. Um, great question. You're gonna you're gonna love that combination. I've used it, um, you know, I've used it quite a bit in um, in in years past. These these days, I primarily just roll with 901C. Um, I, I swap out Turfplex for 901C in that case, but um, but yeah, you're gonna get a great result um, with uh, with that combination with that stack. You're gonna you're gonna like it. I would add um, Biospectrum to it though, if it, if it were me. All right, next up is Mason RC. Says feel better, Ron. Everyone hit that like button. I'm gonna do my best, man. I mean, you know, it's funny. It's it's um. I was talking to, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. You know, he was he's um, he's getting a new lawn. He's like buying a house. He's gonna be getting a new lawn along with the house, which is the most important part. And it was funny. He said, you know, we were we were talking. He says, Ron, he says, it is crazy. He says, you don't realize it. So I don't have to film you. He says, you have you have no idea how much you light up when you start talking about grass. And I'm like, I don't know, man. It's just it's a it's a great topic. I mean, you buy, I mean, you buy the house based on the lawn, right? I mean, based on, buy the house based on two things. One. Can you get like high speed, good, solid, high speed internet? So can you get fiber or something like that? That's thing one. For me as a geek, I need that. And then second, how was the lawn? What are we working with as far as like mowing? And, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I enjoy it, man. I enjoy, um, I enjoy doing this every Friday night and hopefully you guys get some value out of it. All right, Rocky Ward Warrior says, happy Friday, Ron. What's going on, Rocky Ward? And then Aditya um, says, hey, Ron, what's going on, man? Thank you so much for coming to hang out. Um, so um, it's a good, it's a cool. So that if you guys see a lot of the, um, Adit is uh, if you if you see some a lot of the uh, the the shorts, um, he helps with editing some of those. So he's he's one he's one one of my one of my editors that helps out with that. So uh, so thanks man, thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream. I appreciate appreciate the support. And then next up is uh, Matthew Cotton. He says, which Lesco liquid products do you recommend to use along with Carbon Pro G L and granular for spoon feeding on Bermuda grass? Um, so. The only products from Let's Go that I'm, a, that I'm familiar with out of those, Matthew, are the ones you already listed. So Carbon Pro G is um, is their biochar and compost product that Miramichi Green makes for them that I used to use in years past. Carbon Pro L, I don't know who makes that for Let's Go, but that is a liquid product. Um, that was a, that was a good product. I don't know any, uh, I'm not familiar with any other products from them because I've never used anything else from them. Um, and I've not used Carbon Pro L in a spoon feeding program. I imagine you could. Imagine you could. Um, you're still gonna need a um, 
like a fertilizer source of some kind, right? So say you you decided, hey, I don't want to use the carbon kit and I want to use Carbon Pro L, um, and that's that's what you want to go with. Um, you're still going to need some kind of a nitrogen source. So if if it were me, and you'd have to test this because I've not mixed, I've not mixed Turf Plex with Carbon Pro L to know how well it works. I used, back then it was a fertilizer I was using called um, called Brant Supreme Green. It was a great product, but it was kind of hard to find. They, around here you can't really even get it anymore. Um, but if, if you were going to look for something to mix along with that, what I would use, uh, Matthew, if you're going to go with Carbon Pro L is, um, go to the Gulf Force Lawn Store, go to shop and then lawn fertilizer, and then go with, uh, with Turf Plex. Like this is a good, a good product to use for your nitrogen source and, um, also as, as well as your micronutrient source, um, if you're going to be using, uh, that stack, um, as far as fertilizer, Again, not familiar with the Lesco offerings. What I would say is if you need phosphorus, go with the complete 14714. If you don't, go with Humic Max. Um, you know, the the blog post that I have on the topic of spoon feeding, which I will find and link for you here really quick, um, talks about that. I supply rates and everything as far as using um, Humic Max and not Turflex, but Release 901C. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you're if those are the products you're you're deciding you're going to go with, then I would I would use Turfplex as your um, as your fertilizer, your nitrogen source. All right, so here's the blog post that I did on spoon feeding, and hopefully you get some value out of that. Um, it'll give you some ideas. Um, and the big thing I tell you is, although I can't see there there should be any issues, is mix a small amount first, like do a jar test to make sure that uh, Turfplex plays nicely with um, with the Carbon Pro L, and then you're off to the races, man. Spray it every couple of weeks and. Get out there and have fun. I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, next up, we have, let's see here. We have Ben Rayham. He says, uh, hi, Ron. Thanks for taking our questions and hosting as usual. So I scalped to basically the dirt. You went hardcore. Down to the dirt. All right. A few weeks ago, green up is occurring. Is letting uh, the leaf get a little long while still thin good to leave. I am, um, I'm trying to read this again because I'm, I'm not understanding the question. So you scalp the lawn. You're saying, is it okay to let the leaf get a little bit long while still thin? Um, so here's what I would do, Ben. If you, once you scalp, set the mower to the height you intend to maintain the lawn at and just cut it there. So what you'll find is if you scalp, you know, a quarter of an inch and half an inch beneath where you intend to maintain the lawn, the first time you mow it afterwards, then nothing might, you may, it may be too short. Nothing may come off, right? In which case, um, just just keep just keep going, just keep mowing it, or just, and what you'll find is eventually the grass will catch up, and then you will um, you, know, you start getting some clippings. Um, as far as letting it get longer, I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. I would scalp the lawn, and then I would set the mower to the height of cut you intend to maintain it, and then um, and just go from that. So here's something you could do if you want to kind of as a bridge to that. Let's say for example you intend to maintain the lawn at three quarters of an inch, so 0.75 inches, right? Um, and you scalp to a quarter of an inch or so, or there, thereabouts, right? So just under between a quarter and half an inch. What you could do is for the first initial mows of the season, you could set the mower to five eighths, which is 0.625, I think if memory serves me. So 0.625, um, which is kind of in between where you scalped it and where you intend to maintain it when it gets a lot hotter. So you could start there and do your first mow, maybe your first few mows, maybe for the month of March, maybe even to, through April at five eighths. And then in May, you bump it up to three quarters of an inch and then just keep it there for the rest of the season. So that's a way you could, you could, um, you kind of bridge that gap if you wanted to, but I would not let it get long. That's stuff that's that I would not do because you're kind of working against yourself then, right? The idea is we want to, you want to cut off, um, um, all the old, old material. We don't want we don't want to give the Bermuda a chance to get leggy. We don't want to get, allow it to grow long because then whenever you cut it, you're increasing the chances that you're going to have like brown, you know, brown areas in the lawn from doing that. So absolutely would not let it get long. If anything, I would just start mowing it maybe a little, just a little bit shorter than where you intend to maintain it and then slowly work up to your desired height of cut. Good stuff. Great question. Hopefully that helps. Uh, next up is Munir Mahi. He says, thank you for responding to my soul test email recommendations. Appreciate it as always. No problem, Munir. Uh, when you get your results back, uh, feel free to send them my way and I'll do my best to help you out. I mean, it should be pretty clear to understand, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to ping me and I will do my best to help. All right. He says, uh, seems like while it's still very thin, it would allow for maximum photosynthesis. Um, I guess, but I mean, it's, you know, the thing is, 
cutting the grass, you know, cutting the grass stimulates growth. So I would not allow it to get, I still stand by that. I wouldn't allow it to get longer than you intend to maintain it. You just continue to mow it and that's going to help. That's going to stimulate it to, 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 to grow and shoot more leaves so that it can, it can begin, it can begin growing better. So I would not, um, to answer your question, no, I wouldn't, I would not allow the grass to get long after you just took all the time to scalp it. All right, uh, next up is um, Brandon again. He says, fertilizer, for this time of year, what is your take on using higher nitrogen product like a 3404 um, or a triple 13 and just applying at lower rates, like a quarter pound of N per thousand square feet? You could do that. It's a strategy. I mean, some people like to do it. Um, I, I don't. I tend to use a, like for example, the fertilizer that I, I the first granular fertilizer I used this season was a 12024, right? Which is um, a, a larger amount of slow release nitrogen in it than what's in Humic Max. So it's a 12% nitrogen product and a higher potassium. Um, and that's how I like to start the season out. And then I will move over to, to Humic Max, which is has more um, fast release or quick release uh, nitrogen in it. Um, if you're gonna, if you wanna use a higher nitrogen fertilizer and just lower the application rates, um, it, that can work too. It just really depends on, on, on which way you wanna go. I can only speak from, from my experience of um, the products that I've used and the rates that I've used to, to say that the kind of results that I, I can expect and also the kind of results I can tell you that you can expect. Um, if you use um, something different, as long as you get the rates, you know, uh, all right, you should, it should work fine. I'm just not gonna be able to tell you like, you know, use, you know, X number of pounds per thousand and that should produce this result. So um, hope that helps, sir. Hopefully it makes sense. And uh, again, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to let me know. All right, so we have uh, Turf Brothers is in the house. He's happy Friday, Ron, and the rest of the golf course lawn squad. What's going on, Turf Brothers? Thank you guys so much. I got to show off that cup you get. That's the you sent me, man. I know you guys, these guys are really cool. They sent me a um like a, a tumbler. Um, I so I can so I can get it here and I can show it on the live stream. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much for that. It was really cool. Um, and uh, and again, thanks for for taking some time out of your Friday night to come hang out and uh, and talk about some lawn care. All right, uh, next up is Daniel W. He says, can you explain how Blue Muda works? Do the two coexist and stay green year round? I, so I, I'm not gonna be speaking from direct experience, Daniel, because I don't have it. Um, the idea behind Blue Muda is to take certain cultivars of um, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, I'm not sure which one they actually use for it, and to um, overseed or intermix that with Bermuda grass. The idea is because um, Kentucky bluegrass is a cool season uh, grass type, it tends to stay um, green during the fall and winter months when Bermuda goes dormant. Um, and then Bermuda does better during the spring, summer months, whenever Kentucky bluegrass and other cool season grass types um, tend to struggle. So the idea is you, in theory anyway, is you can get the best of both worlds by having two grass types. I'm not a fan of it and, and here's why. And again, I'm, I'm not just saying I'm in the minority, but I'll give you the reason why, why I'm not a fan of doing that is that if you look at um, what you're, essentially what you're doing, you're, you're introducing another grass, you can introduce two grasses that can be competing against each other. That's thing one. And then second, if you have to do any kind of herbicide control, like any kind of weed control on your lawn, like you are limiting the options that you have available. Because if you have a, only a Bermuda lawn, you can use Celsius, you can use Certainty, you can use a lot of herbicides that are designed for use on warm season turf. If you're using Bermuda, you can't do that because you've got Kentucky bluegrass in there and you will injure or kill it if you spray it with Celsius or Certainty. Um, outside of that, outside of that, let's say you've got a great lawn, you got no weeds in it, right? You've got it all figured out, so there's no weeds in your lawn whatsoever. But let's say you wanted to use something like Growth Regulator, like Primo Max. The rates for Kentucky Bluegrass are quite a bit different than the rates are for hybrid Bermuda. As a matter of fact, the rates for Kentucky Bluegrass um, are almost double. So it's like, if memory serves me, it's like 0.6 ounces per thousand for, um, for KBG, and it's um, like a quarter of an ounce per thousand for Bermuda. So which rate do you use? You know what I mean? So it's like one of those things where you're, you're, you are outside of just trying to control pests in your lawn, just from a standpoint of, um, of using like growth regulator, like which one you're going to be compromising one way or the other. You're either going to be over applying it on the Bermuda or under applying it on the Kentucky bluegrass. So for me, I'm just not, I'm just not a fan. I think if you really want a green lawn throughout the fall and winter months, um, go out and overseed with perennial ryegrass and then just get rid of it this time of year in the March time frame. That's what I would say to do. So that's my thoughts on it. Um, and you know, for most people, I really wouldn't, I really wouldn't recommend or encourage it for the reasons that I, that I, I outlined and hopefully it makes sense to you. 
All right, so we have another super chat. This one is from Mr. Brandon Kennedy. Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, let me get that real quick. Super chat for CFL. He's thanks for both responses. Wishing you a great 2024 lawn season. I am hoping so, man. I got I got a good feeling about 2024. Granted, here's the thing. I say that about every season, about every lawn care season, but this year especially, I think it's going to be especially good. So, uh, so yeah. Thank you for the super chat. I do appreciate um, all of the support. And then um, next up, we have Colin. C. Pims is in the house. He says, what's up, Ron? Hopefully your Friday has been well. Anything you'd recommend for real high calcium levels in soil? Um, I have a feeling my clay soil is obviously part of the problem. Thanks. No, not really. Um, you know, if I look at soil test results from Texas, like, like San Antonio, Texas area, like the middle of Texas, um, like they tend to have high calcium um, pretty much in all the samples that I look at. And it doesn't prevent people from having great stands of turf grass. So the thing I would say is if you can avoid adding more, that would be good. But having high calcium levels is not really going to hold you back from having a, uh, a great lawn. So nothing, nothing really to worry about. There's not really a way to get to reduce it in a vacuum. And given the, the kind of soil you have, it's just, it's just probably something that's, that's just part of the, the nutrient makeup of the soil in the, in the area that you happen to be in. So really wouldn't sweat it wouldn't sweat it. So focus on the on the other two sides of the soil test of, of the, the macros and your micros. And then obviously, um, do your best to keep the your your soil pH in in the Goldilocks zone mid sixes, and uh, you really shouldn't have a hard time growing a great looking lawn. Good, good question. All right, so next up we have um, C Pims. Uh, next up we have Ant Live. Ant Live, he says, Hey Ron, I have Bermuda grass and I want to overseed this year since it's been five years. What month would be the best to apply in the Virginia area? So if you're talking about overseeding Bermuda with Bermuda, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, there's there's not really, I don't know what kind of Bermuda you have, but in, in general, you know, the only the only cultivar that looked that worked fairly well if you did this is if you had a Tifway 419 lawn and if you had Arden 15 or Princess 77 because they look reasonably close together. Um, the other Bermuda cultivars that you can grow from seed, like common ones that are still available, like Monaco, Yukon, um, they look quite a bit different to, um, to your hybrids. So I wouldn't do that. Um, the thing with overseeding, that's really more of a cool season lawn thing. The only Thing I'd say the only time I'd say you'd, you'd ever want to overseed Bermuda grass is would be in the fall. And if you're overseeding it with a rye grass to help keep it green, to help not keep Bermuda green, but to keep your lawn green over the fall and winter. But as far as like overseeding Bermuda with Bermuda, I don't recommend it um, because in for most people, you're trying to solve a problem of the lawn being a little bit thin or there's, you know, not looking the way you want it to look. You're trying to solve um, the problem the wrong way because Bermuda, if it's got getting enough sunlight, getting the right amount of nutrient, it will grow like wildfire. It's not difficult to grow Bermuda and have it and have it look well. And the thing you'll find at live is if you take, let's say you have a Tifway 419 lawn and you go and you introduce like Yukon or Monaco or some some other um, improved common Bermuda, um, you're you're not gonna you're gonna, not gonna be able to get rid of it because from a growth perspective, they are different. Like they the growth rates are different, the leaf texture is different, um, the color is gonna look a little bit different. And the thing with Bermuda is once it's in, once you put that that um, that uh, co improved common into the lawn, you know, heaven help you, you're not gonna be able to really get rid of it. There's not currently um, a a way to selectively remove common Bermuda from a hybrid Bermuda lawn or vice versa or, or hybrid from common. So once you, you put it in, it's pretty much there. So I would um, discourage you from doing that. Now you're in Virginia. If you're talking about overseeding in the fall with ryegrass, then yeah, I mean, the late August or September timeframe would be the time to look into doing that. But if you're talking about overseeding Bermuda with Bermuda, I would um, discourage you from doing that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to create problems that are not easy to fix. So I uh, so hope that helps. Um, and if, again, if, if you have any other follow-up or any other uh, questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will, uh, I will do my best to, uh, to help you out. All right. Uh, next up is Munir Mahid. He says, can you please talk about the dethatching debate in Bermuda? Do or don't? I recently did mine. I could see the benefits of getting all that dead material pulled out. Others may differ. Your thoughts? Okay. So, the big thing I would say, um, Munir, is we have to we have to agree on terminology. If you are saying dethatcher from the standpoint of, I'm sorry, I've still got it here. If you're talking about a dethatcher from the standpoint of using 
one of these on a Bermuda lawn, then no, I would not do that. I would not do that, it's far too aggressive, you're just gonna make a big mess and it, you're gonna stress the turf unnecessarily. I don't think there's really any benefit to, to doing something like this to a Bermuda grass lawn. Or really most most lawns, even cool season lawns, really this, I mean, it's, it's unless you've got a lawn that's been neglected for, you know, for a decade where it's highly compact and you're trying to really like do a reset, maybe you dethatch it once. But the thing that I think that most lawns can benefit from, assuming you set it up properly, is um, is turf raking. So if we go back here, and of course I'm on the homeowner stuff, so they call it a scarifier for Lord knows what reason. Like this, which is the are the spring loaded fingers, like this is beneficial. You know what I mean? Again, if you if you want um, if you want to to see the difference that it can make in a lawn, I kind of covered this already earlier. Is look at like videos of my lawn from two or three years ago and look at videos in the last couple of years. Like the biggest difference that's changed has been um, regular turf raking or scarifying and um, and verticutting, but I don't dethatch it. So if you're talking about dethatching from the standpoint of what I just showed you, like the solid blade, space far apart, like a, like a hooked end of it that's very aggressive. No, I would not do that. Um, if you're talking about this, which is a you know, a, a, a way of gently removing debris, old clippings out of a lawn. If you set it up properly, I am all for that. I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing to do um, to, to your lawn. In addition to that, if you have, um, so I have a picture of a verticutter here. Um, in addition to turf raking, if you can also verticut it, especially if you have a, um, a lawn like a uh, grass type like Bermuda or Zoysia that tends to get thick, especially when you're real mowing it, like those can, can benefit quite a bit from um, from a regular verticutting, like once per month, does does wonders to um, to to the to the appearance um, and just the, the the cutting benefits of the lawn. So something like this, I do once per month, you know. So oh, during like during the growing season. So um, again, dethatching in the truest sense of the of the word, like like what I was just showing you, not something I'm a fan of doing. Um, gently scarifying. Gently verticutting, yes, I am a fan of doing that. And by gently, I mean you're not carving channels into the earth as you're doing it. Like you're letting the equipment run two to four millimeters above the surface, and that that produces a great result. If you want to see for yourself, uh, Munir, I've got a. I did this last year. I may do it again this year, but I did a live stream last year in the end of May, where I did all of them. I verticut, turf rake, and then I did a, a finally a cleanup mow. And you can see the results for yourself. So it's like a almost a three hour live stream where I was out in the lawn on a Saturday or Sunday, whenever it was. And um, you can see the entire process. You can literally watch the lawn transform before your eyes. It already looks good. It looks even better when I'm done with it. So um, so if you want to see uh, verticutting, um, uh, turf raking, and mowing, if you got like three hours to burn, uh, then you can check out this live stream from from last year where I do all of that. So to answer your question, I'm a fan of it. Not a, I'm a fan of verticutting and turf raking. Not a fan of dethatching. And as and the big thing is is make sure you do them properly. Don't go too aggressive. And again, if you if you don't, the proof's in the pudding is what I can say. Like the biggest difference between how my lawn looks now and how it's looked in years past is the introduction of those two cultural practices. So you can decide. Um, you know, you can decide for yourself. All right, next up is Gary G. Freeze in the house. He says, hey, Ron, a Stripe Action Gang. Hit the like button. Definitely, guys. We got 155 folks in the live stream and only 103 likes. Surely we can do better. So if you guys are getting some value out of it, having some fun, sitting back with your cocktail while we talk about turf grass, hit that like button. It costs you absolutely nothing. It's a free way to support the channel. All right, next up is uh, Lucindo Nava. I think you are new. I've not, I've not seen your name before. So if you are new, welcome. She says, would you do post-emergent at this time if you have weeds or liquid aerate and put down fertilizer? Okay, so great question, uh, Lucinda. Those things, like literally every one of those things you mentioned are all disconnected. So if you decide you wanna use post-emergent to control weeds, like you applying fertilizer doesn't really matter with that. You doing aeration, again, doesn't really matter with that. So if you have weeds in your lawn and you want to control them using a post-emergent herbicide, by all means, go for it. Um, if you want to use a liquid aeration product, I think, I personally think they have limited value. I think like regular core aeration is better, go for it. And as far as fertilizing, um, you know, if it's time it, wherever you are to do that, then yes, you can fertilize your lawn because they're all different. You think about it. Fertilizer is to feed the um, feed the lawn, feed the turf grass. Um, uh, an aeration 
um, is the idea behind it is to relieve compaction, allow air, water, and nutrients to get into the soil. So it's just better, just a way to kind of, um, you know, just improve the soil profile and just make 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 things a little. Um, just it's, it's a good reset for the for the lawn throughout the season. And then post emergent herbicides are just for cleaning up weeds. So if the the answer to your question is if the weeds you are trying to target is actively growing now, then yes, use a post emergent herbicide to control it. Uh, and then the other ones I've already explained how they kind of fit into that picture. So um, it's a good question. Um, they're not, you know, I, I, a common question I get from people are like, can you fertilize your lawn and kill weeds in the same day? I'm like, yeah, why not? I mean, you absolutely, they're, they're completely different, completely different processes. I mean, you know, you're one, you're gonna, you're gonna be using a herbicide to control the weeds and you're gonna be using fertilizer to help to, to feed your lawn. You know what I mean? So it, the, the concern that a lot of folks have is that if I fertilize and I'm trying to kill weeds, am I gonna make the weeds grow faster? If you think about it, if you're spraying a post-emergent herbicide, which is the idea behind it, it's like a chemical that's designed to injure the plant. Um, you know, it, it's even if you put down fertilizer, that's not gonna really help it recover. It's gonna, you're, you're going, you're gonna injure it, and then when you mow it, it's gonna be a lot harder for it to, to come back. So you could literally fertilize and control weeds on the same day if you wanted to, and it's not, you're not really working against yourself. Um, if you were to, uh, if you were to do that. So hopefully that helps, um, Lucinda, it, it, it really, and hopefully my explanation around like the timing of when you would use like a post-emergent herbicide, um, makes sense as, um, as well. All right. Next up, we got Oliver in the house, Oliver Rittum. He says, happy Friday, Ron and everyone. How long does it take for carbon, uh, Carbon Pro G and Essential G to be absorbed into the soil. I've applied after my scalp and I got a good amounts of rain, but still see the granules. So um, that's a great question, um, Oliver. Um, so Miramichi did some testing. I think it was with um, it was some university in North Carolina, um, and they saw they saw um, results from um, a Carbon Pro G application. Like they saw it being reflected in the soil in the soil data. Uh, three weeks after application. So you may see some of the granules, but once you water it in, like it's already getting in the soil, it's already beginning to work. Um, and to answer your question, based on their testing, three weeks from the time you apply it is when um, it can make a, a measurable difference um, in the soil. So, uh, so yeah, I really, I really wouldn't sweat it. Um, they will, any granules that, you, that you're still seeing will break down over time. And uh, just, you know, just keep applying it, keep mowing, keep fertilizing, just keep doing all the things you know how to do. And great a great lawn is a uh, is a byproduct so that's a that's a good question good 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 question and you know oliver for that question i'm not sure if we've done this already but if you if you've not won before and if you have you have to let me know because I, i'm sure you can do it again if you um for that question about carbon pro g essential essential g um we will make you our miramichi question of the week i haven't done one of these in a while so why not give away some free swag, right? So if you want your Greatness from the Ground Up t-shirt free at no charge to you, send me an email saying, hey, Ron, this is Oliver. I won. Um, can you can you uh, tell me how to claim my free shirt? Because um, this was a good question. It was related to Miramichi, and I think they will um, they'll, they'll appreciate that. But the long short of it is within three weeks, you'll start seeing the benefits from it. And, um, and I really wouldn't worry about any little granules that you see. Again, over time, they are going to, um, they're going to break down. All right, next up we have, um, Munir just became a member. Thank you so much, Munir, I appreciate that, man. Next up is Ahmad Jones. He says, happy Friday. I live in Memphis and we are expecting a freeze next week. Should I scalp my lawn after the freeze? Yeah, Ahmad, if you have not scalped yet and you wanna wait till after the freeze passes, by all means, wait. Let's know, uh, there's no negative for doing that. Um, no worries at all with um, with giving it a little bit more time to uh, to scalp if you're worried about you know the, the, the little cold snap we're gonna get. It's not gonna stick around long. But you know, if you want to wait till after that to scalp, you can do so. Uh, Andre Taylor, he says, "Good evening, Ron and Lawn Community. Uh, Ron, any suggestions on dealing with snakes? I saw a baby snake on Monday when I was out scalping the lawn. Uh, no, not really. Um, I don't. You know, I don't know about anything about snake repellent. I mean, most of the snakes that you see, unless they're, I mean, unless it's venomous, most of the snakes are actually." Are, they're actually good. I don't like snakes. I'm not a fan of snakes at all. Um, but um, but most of them are actually they're not they're not necessarily a bad thing as far as keeping rodents away from your property. Um, as far as repellent, you'd have to you have to do some research. I don't know what repellent you can use for um, for snakes. So I'm not going to be um, uh, much help for you on this one, unfortunately, Andre. But if you're not afraid of snakes and you know you you don't you're fine with it being around, um, they, there's a lot of benefits to them being around. 
All right, Mark Luna is up next. He says, good evening, Ron. Looking nice and green in central Texas. Patiently waiting for the revolution to arrive. Loving the sunny evening. Let's get it. Yeah, man, you guys should be getting your mower soon. YouTube is going to be flooded with uh, Revolution 26 content once uh, once those mowers land, man. So should be a, uh, a good time. You guys are going to like it. I was, I you know, I, I saw it. Um, I, I've seen the the final version. I think there's actually a guy that has one. Um I think it's Lawn Dad or something like that. He has, um, like Lee got him one. So if you want to see all the all the features and benefits and like the, the final revision is going to have, uh, Lee also did a, a, a recent video on the um, the final version of the Revolution, the one that you guys are getting. So uh, so yeah, it's I think it's it's got a lot going for it. It's it takes a lot. It takes the best part from a lot of different mowers. You know what I mean? So especially at the price point, it's uh, it's pretty tough to beat. All right, next up is Our Fragrance Journey says, hey, Ron, again, again with the Roll Tide, again. I mean, <clears throat> <clears throat> we allowed this last week whenever Devin was, was here visiting because we have, <clears throat> because we have, we had company. But I mean, we gotta, we gotta stop, cut all this Roll Tide talk all the time, guys, come on. He says, also, I'm helping my neighbor renovate her, her lawn and she wants Bermuda. She currently has 75% dirt and 25% St. Augustine, steps to kill the grass and still have time to plant the Bermuda. Uh, okay, so if you're just trying to burn everything down, so you're not trying to like, you're not, you're not trying to do a selective um, kill off, just use use glyphosate. I mean, that's, uh, that is an inex inexpensive way of doing it. It may take a couple of rounds to get the St. Augustine uh, really knocked back. Um, but I'd say, you know, really of those two, a round of glyphosate to kill off the St. Augustine, um, and then I would do your preparation, you know, get out, get out like a nice um, granular biosimilant to prepare the soil, Carbon Pro G, Essential G, um, and then introduce and then put the sod in. Because um, the nice thing is with Bermuda, if you if any St. Augustine still grows through after the Bermuda sod has gone in, um, it's pretty easy to control St. Augustine in Bermuda. You can use Quinclorac to do that. So Bermuda tolerates it pretty well, St. Augustine not so much. So, uh, so yeah, I would, I would use just glyphosate, you know, Ranger Pro or some, to pick some other, like, um, some glyphosate product. I think Eraser is another one. Just pick, pick a, you know, a, a glyphosate concentrate, um, and use that to, to burn off anything in the lawn that you want to get rid of. Um, and it, I would then follow it up with a, an application of, um, Essential G or Carbon Pro G, lay the sod on top of that, and then, you know, water and just let the, let the grass grow in. If you see some St. Augustine a little bit come back, which you may see some, like I said, it's really easy to control using, um, using Quinclorac. So that is how I would, um, I would go after that. That's how I would solve that, uh, that problem. And it's good on you, man. Even though you're not a Bulldogs fan, I can't say, here's the thing, here's the thing. You Alabama folks are not, our Alabama fans are not that bad. Devin's an Alabama fan. You know, you're helping your neighbor out. So even though, you know, you don't have the best taste in football teams, you're still a good guy when it comes to, you know, helping your neighbor. So I gotta, I gotta, I gotta recognize that. You have to, you have to always see the silver lining, right? All right. Next up is Ravi Patel. He says, is it a good idea to put winter rye grass on Bermuda? And would you transition from rye to Bermuda? Would the transition be easy? So if you're asking about would it be a good idea to overseed Bermuda with perennial ryegrass in the fall? Yeah, if you want your lawn to stay green during the fall and winter months when everyone else's lawn is dormant, sure, by all means, go for it. Um, the transition from rye to Bermuda, like this time of the year, when Bermuda is beginning to wake up, when the ryegrass still actually looks pretty good because the ryegrass this time of year still looks actually looks really good. Um, you're really going to want to get rid of it. So you're going to want to use a selective herbicide. There's tons of tons you can use. You can use... Um, you can use katana. You can use there's several ones that'll that'll do it. Um, but I'm a fan of using Celsius to uh, to get rid of ryegrass. Um, and as long as you do it like in the in the March time frame again, assuming you're in the same area, the same climate as what as what we have here in Georgia, um, that's going to allow the ryegrass to die off and then the Bermuda to to wake up and um, and transition out of dormancy nicely. So that's the big thing, Ravi. Is that if you if you decide to overseed in the fall to have with a rut with perennial ryegrass, you have to get rid of it in the early spring time for Bermuda to not lag behind. And the, the thing that's painful is you're doing it when the ryegrasses are actually looking really good. Like this time of year, rye, a ryegrass lawn looks looks pretty sweet, right? But you're going to be, if you want Bermuda to do well, you got to get rid of it so the Bermuda isn't, so it's not competing with Bermuda as it's trying to come out of dormancy. So, um, so there you go. Um, I'll, I'll tell you like the real rollers, like on their Bermuda lawn, they have Tiff, Tiff Tough, 
Um, and they overseed it with ryegrass, and it looks great, you know. But they're gonna they're gonna be spraying it out here pretty soon to um, to allow the Bermuda to do its thing. So hope that helps, Robbie. Um, if you decide to go for it, um, take pictures, keep me posted. You know, if, you, if you've been following the live stream for a while, take a look at um, at Robert Rainey's lawn. I mean, it, his lawn looked incredible when it was overseed with ryegrass. I mean, it was a thing of beauty. Um, but it's just, you no. Know, now is when you got to pay, you got to pay the price. You got to get rid of it so the Bermuda can really wake up and do and do well. Okay, next up is Tom Steele. He says, when should I dethatch a bluegrass lawn in the mid-Atlantic? Again, unless your lawn just has like, um, like it's like it's just been neglected for years and years, Tom. I really am not a fan of people dethatching it. I mean, you're I've already I've already explained this twice in the live stream, so I'm not gonna go through it again. But um, if you're talking about like power raking, like a power rake to help remove old dead material, like I'm all for doing that. But as far as dethatching, where you're ripping a lot of the lawn out, just you just being really aggressive, I don't think there's there's really a ton of benefits to doing that. I just I, so I, I wouldn't recommend it. Turf raking or power raking. Or scarifying, they're all called the same thing. They're all they're all like in my word, my mind, synonyms for the same thing. Um, that would be okay, but actual dethatching, which is very aggressive, I'm not I'm not a fan of um, of doing. So, um, as far as when you can do that, um, whenever the if you said you are going to turf rake it or power rake it, um, this time of year, I imagine your bluegrass lawn is looking pretty good. It's still it's still grow, it's growing actively. So any kind of slight stress that it, that it experiences from you doing this process, assuming you go too aggressive, um, it'll recover quickly from. So now would be good. I mean, if the lawn, if you're out there mowing, if the lawn is growing well, um, and you want to do a, again, a gentle uh, power rake, turf rake, scarify, or all different ways of saying the same thing, that would be okay. But dethatching, I, again, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, um, fan of that for, for lawns, for most lawns. <coughs> all right. So, <clears throat> Next up is Top Colin. He says, how long do you wait to use Celsius <clears throat> on a newly sodded lawn? Thanks, Ron. So on a, on a newly sodded lawn, I mean, I would want it to get established to where <clears throat> you're mowing it regularly. I, I want to give it at least a couple of months. And really, the thing to keep in mind, uh, Colin, is really on a new lawn, you shouldn't have to do a broadcast spray. So if you're going to be using Celsius just to spot spray broadleaf weeds here and there, that I don't really see a huge issue with. You can do that, you know, a couple months in. I mean, I, I can't see a scenario where you'd have a brand new lawn, it's that you're mowing it regularly, and now it's all just covered up in weeds unless you were neglecting it. So a broadcast spray of Celsius over a newly sodded lawn really should not be necessary. Um, spot spraying, again, a couple of months, once the lawn is rooted in nicely, you're out there mowing it, you're feeding it. If you want to spot spray weeds here and there, that would be absolutely fine. I would avoid broadcast sprays um, as for, for, you know, three months, three months, maybe longer, just not, not trying to introduce any kind of stress. So all the Celsius, again, is not really a, um, a harsh herbicide when it comes to warm season turf, but it just really shouldn't be necessary for a newly sodded lawn. You know what I mean? It's, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to broadcast spray herbicide over a brand new lawn. It should, you should be just spot spraying. And in that case, you know, Celsius would be fine. So good question. Um, hope that helps. Don't, um, and guys, remember the, the idea, you can take this as a, as a moment to just kind of talk, chat about this, is that, you know, you should look at herbicides really as a tool to, to get ahead, right? So the idea of, you know, if you're out there, so the question I'll get is, should I, should I be spraying my lawn with like Celsius every month? Ideally, no. I mean, you shouldn't, hopefully not, right? I mean, the idea is that you want to use herbicides as a way to injure or con to kill, control the the plants that we don't want in our lawns, the weeds that we don't want in our lawns. And that's going to give the plant that we do want, which is in your case, a Bermuda lawn, the chance to become the dominant plant in your, on your property. So it's a, by using a herbicide to knock back the weeds, and then you, you have a good nutrient program where you're feeding the lawn and you're regularly mowing it, that's going to allow it to thicken up. And that serves as like natural re weed control to where you're making it much more difficult for weeds to even establish. And, that, and at that point, you're really just using Celsius or any kind of herbicide just for spot spraying, which is really how you uh, you would want to, to, to do that. Like for example, on my lawn, I have I I can't tell you when I don't, I don't think I've I'm trying to think about it. I don't think I've ever broadcast sprayed post-emergent herbicide on my entire lawn. Like I've spot sprayed here and there, but as far as like like the entire lawn gets hit with Celsius, it's I, it's not been necessary. Um, 
typically throughout the year, um, I will have a couple of areas that where I always have issues with sedges and that's where certainty will come out and I'll spray those. It maybe takes one or two applications and then it's gone. Um, the, a case where you are doing a broadcast spray is whenever you are cleaning up a lawn that's been neglected. So again, we talk about my neighbor's lawn, right? Cause that's a good example. It's been a couple of years at this point, but it's a great example. When they moved in, the previous owner, like the, the lawn care service that was taking care of it obviously wasn't there anymore because there was no one in the house for a little while. Um, and during that time, that means no pre-emergent and that means the weeds just ran rampant and took over the lawn. So in that case where you've got, t you know, weeds all throughout the lawn, that is when a broadcast spray of post-emergent herbicides makes sense. But that was like a one-time thing. You know, once you did that, you were, you're, you're getting ahead of the game. You start mowing it regularly and then the weeds have a hard time, um, reestablishing or, or, or keeping up at that point, you just spot spraying as needed. If that makes sense. So kind of a sidebar as far as just like, you know, you know, proper use of herbicides, you want to look at them as a tool for giving your, your, your turf grass a competitive advantage. Um, you, you, pretty much using it to buy time, right? You're, you're getting rid of the weeds. It's going to give you plenty of time to be, to, to get your nutrient program under, under, under control, up your mowing frequency, which is going to cause the grass to thicken up. And that in itself is going to be great, um, great weed control. And really at that point, the only thing you really have to rely on is, um, is pre-emergent. I'm a fan of using pre-emergent, um, you know, in the spring and in the fall. But if you guys were on the live stream last week with Devin, you, know, you heard him talk. I, I think he, I want to recall him saying that, I mean, I don't think he even uses pre-emergent or if he does, it's only like once a year. And the reason why he's able to do that is because he's, you know, he's got that natural weed control. He's always mowing and he's feeding the lawn. He's got a really thick sand of grass, which makes it really difficult for weeds to, uh, to establish. So hope that helps, sir. Um, if you need anything else, uh, do let me know. All right, next up is Russell Hood. Russell Hood, he says, when scalping for the first time with a real um, real mower, will I ha need to have the real sharpened afterwards? Uh, depends on how aggressive you go with it, Russell. If um, if you take it down to the dirt where you're, the real the real embed knife are getting into, you're not just cutting grass. Uh, yeah, you you could have to, you may have to do a back lap afterwards at a minimum. In some more extreme cases, you may have to send it in for a grind. If you um, if you primarily just cut grass, not necessarily. So this is a reason why I I, I tend to tell folks that if you are planning on maintaining your lawn at say three quarters of an inch, right? While some folks are a, are a fan of taking it down to the dirt, which is, I mean, that is a better clean out. Like you are like literally you are doing a, a better clean out by, go, by cutting it lower. Um, you are, it's really hard on your equipment. So if you're someone like you where you're saying, hey, I don't want to, you know, I want to get the benefits of scalping, but I don't want to have to stick my mower in for a sharpen after I'm done. If your plan is to maintain the lawn at three quarters of an inch, consider scalping it to say half an inch, half an inch, maybe just under, just barely under half an inch. That way you get the benefits of scalping without putting a lot of wear and tear on your equipment to where you have to send it in for um, for servicing. So the answer to your question is it depends. Depends on how aggressive you are with it. If you don't go too aggressive, you shouldn't necessarily have to. Um, but the big thing is you got you got to keep the mower out of the dirt. If it gets if you run a reel and bed knife through through any kind of any kind of dirt sand, um, you you are going to have to you're going to have to sharpen it again. A back lap at a minimum. Um, in more extreme cases, you're gonna have to send it in for a grind. So, um, which is all the reasons why I'd say don't go too aggressive. All right, next up <clears throat> is JK. He says, I live in your area, just coming out of dormancy. Can I spot treat with Celsius uncertainty? Yep, sure can. So if you got like broadleaf weeds, you got, um, what would you have this time of year? If you have some clover and some henbit you're trying to get rid of, you can use uh, Celsius if you got Poannua, which is what everybody's like. I did, like this this month, the last like three to four weeks have been like the like uh, Poa questions. So if you got Poa and you want to get rid of it, yes, um, you can use you can use Certainty for that. So uh, so yeah, J.K. And the nice thing, like what you said, is you are going to be spot spraying. So just in the areas where you see the weeds, you're going to be not you're going to be you know just spot treating instead of broadcast uh, spraying the entire lawn with herbicides. So good stuff. It's a good, a good question. Uh, next up is Tito Serrano. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna make note of that one, JK, because I, I, I like that question. And you know, other folks will likely have it too. All right, Tito Serrano says, hey Ron, what do you think about the California trimmer? I'm looking to start to mow my lawn at less than half an inch. Um, it's a good mower. I mean, I I am not a I'm not a fan of the propulsion system of the um of the trimmer. I don't like the controls of the trimmer as much as I do the true cut. Um, but true cuts have been pretty hard to come by. Like you can't really find them. And if you do have one, good luck getting parts for it if it breaks. 
So if you can get your hands on a trimmer Tito and you know you like the way it's set up and you're getting a good deal on one, then by all means, um, if you are um, if you're the market for a brand new mower, I don't know what the trimmers cost, but man, I get I would really would give the Revolution a hard look. I mean that mower, especially at the price point, has a lot got a lot of good things going for it. You know what I mean? So. Um, the trimmer, if you like it, by all means. Um, but if if I were in the market for a, a brand new real mower at sub three thousand dollar price point, um, the Revolution is where I would be looking if it were me. All right. Uh, next up is JK. He says, "How do I get rid of earthworms in my Bermuda? Hundreds of castings already. Uh, you don't. You don't. You just, you just don't worry about it. Um, you know, I get um, earthworm castings in um, in my lawn, particularly after rainfall. You start seeing them. Like the day after it rains, you start seeing them more. But it's um, it's nothing really to worry about. It's a sign of healthy soil. Um, I would not actively try and get rid of earthworms. Whenever you go out and you real mow, the front roller will just will mash the castings down, and then you won't see them anymore. So, if you mow your lawn every few days, it's not really anything. You're they, they, they never get bad enough to where they're kind of an eyesore. You know what I mean? So. Um, I really wouldn't worry about it, JK. It's a sign of healthy soil. Next up is Mary J. She says, hey, Ron, are you running irrigation or letting Mother Nature handle it? Also, when do you start with PGRs? Great question, Mary. So um, I, ran a, <clears throat> I ran a short irrigation cycle two days ago, but then it was kind of unnecessary because today we got a bunch of rain this morning. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not watering regularly as yet. It likely won't be until mid-April when I turn on my irrigation and have it run uh, twice per week. I think it's set for Tuesday and Thursdays. I think it's how it's set up. Um, and then as far as uh, with Regulator, I'll be introducing that in mid to late April is when I will start using uh, Primo Max on my lawn. It really depends on how the lawn is looking. If it's, you know, if it's when it's nicely greened up and I'm starting to mow it more regularly, I'll start introducing Growth Regulator at, um, at low rates. So irrigation, not running it regularly yet. Primo, late, I mean, mid-April, mid to late April is when I'm going to start with uh, with that. So good question. And uh, hopefully that is um, is helpful for you. You know, I'm going to be getting my Primo out there, but it's just, just it's not time yet. Not, not, uh, not time yet. If you're in Florida, um, you could, but if you're, you know, Georgia, not, not quite go time yet. All right. <clears throat> Next up is Cleve or Cle I'm, I, I'm sure I'm gonna pronounce your name. I'm gonna say Cleve Anderson. This is Poa Anua and Travalis in Cool Season Lawn. Best treatment to get rid of as much as possible. I currently put down Sublime last week in February and put down Prodiamine and do fall pre-emergent yearly. Yeah, so Poa in Cool Season Turf Grass is um is a tough one. There's not really <clears throat> there's not really a good post-emergent herbicide that's rated for labeled for use on residential turf that um for controlling poa um if you've already got it in your lawn what you can use is this this is another use for growth regulator right so if you got a cool season lawn you can use primo um one of the things that primo does is it, it helps suppress poanio's ability to throw off seed heads like the little white seed heads you see in the middle um, of the plant, which makes it stand out less. Like you don't, like it's still there, but it's not as much of an eyesore. You don't have these big patches of white throughout the um, your otherwise green lawn. The other thing you can do is, um, it's kind of what you said, is as far as your pre-emergent. Now you, if you only did one pre-emergent app last fall, that's typically not gonna be enough. You may have to do like a couple, like a split app. So one in the early fall and then another one before maybe you get your first frost to help, to help um, get that residual in the soil and help prevent um, the chances of you getting you know, a poanio growing through, but the best way is to prevent it. We have a cool season lawn using um, pre-emergent is, is your best strategy for keeping poa um, out of your lawn. Like once it's there, you can pull it out. Like you can weed it. You can pull it out. You can mask it with using a, pro a growth regulator like Primo. There's just not really a lot of good selective post-emergent herbicides for um, for poanio, unfortunately. So sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Um, but, um, I'd say this next fall, this upcoming fall, maybe consider instead of doing one pre-emergent app, do like a split app again, like one earlier in the season and then one, you know, maybe a few weeks before you intend to get like, um, the weather starts taking a turn for the worse, um, to try and extend that coverage and see if you get a better result the, um, the, the following year. So good question, uh, Cleve, like there's a, there's, there's, there's products for it, for POA. Um, but the ones that I'm aware of, aren't labeled for use on um on residential lawns like they they yeah in the label they actually say do not do not spray this on residential turf grass so 
Um, so I'm not going to tell you the names of them because I don't want you to go out and buy it. All right. So next up is Tito. Okay. I think you already said that. He says he's looking to get um, a California trimmer. It's in your budget. Well, there you go. If the California trimmer is in your budget, that's what you should get. The big thing is, I'll, I'll tell you this much, um, Tito. For as long as the mower is set up properly and it's sharp, you're going to get a good result with it. That's the most important, the, the most important thing, whether your mower is a Toro Greensmaster, a True Cut, a Revolution, uh, an Alice C27, the most important thing, the most by far with a real mower is that it is sharp, that it's sharp and that it's cutting paper all the way across, it's set up properly, you're gonna get a great result. Um, so if that's what you get your budget, it allows you to afford, that's what you should get, set it up properly and knock yourself out mowing, mowing your lawn, have a, have a great time with it. Uh, next up is um, the Everyday Life says, what would you do if you have hard clay soil? My Bermuda is thin and I did a soil test and I, it says I need phosphorus and organic matter. I've been adding fertilizer last year, but it is not improved. So what I would say the Everyday Life is um, the, the way that I would relieve compaction in a clay soil um, lawn is with um, core aeration. I mean, core aeration is is by far, in my opinion, the best way to relieve to really compacted soil. Um, and then on top of that, what you can do is consider top dressing. So if you go out and you do a core, a good core aeration, you beat the lawn up in multiple different directions, and then you top dress it on top of that with a, um, with a combination, a blend of sand and soil, you're slowly changing the, the soil profile, at least the, the upper portion of it, to where you're gonna make it more difficult for compaction to become a problem going forward. It's gonna drain better after top dressing it, um, so there's a host of benefits. So I would say core aerate, like actual, like manual core aeration, and then top dressing. And that is, that's gonna, that's gonna allow you to see some, some results as far as um, reducing the problems from a hard, from a hard clay soil. You know, I always, I always tell folks, I mean, um, the biggest benefit or one of the biggest um, unanticipated benefits of top dressing is how much better the lawn drains after the first time I did it. Because like, you guys have seen my lawn before, when I get like a really heavy rain, um, like a pool will literally form back there in the, in the, in the lawn, right? Um, and that, in years past, but prior to like really getting, going on this lawn care journey and top dressing and getting the lawn in, in order, it would be there for over a day. Like it'd be a puddle, a, pu a pool in the lawn, it would sit there for over a day, it'd look horrible. The first time, after the first time I, I had a nice core aeration done, I had the lawn top dressed, Literally, it doesn't matter how heavy it rains. In worst case, three hours later, once the rain stops, all the water, it just pulls water away from the surface. So it helps, it really helps with drainage. Um, so that, in your case, that is what I would um, I would encourage you to do. I think you're really gonna like the benefits um, from, you know, from doing a good core aeration and, uh, and top dressing. You didn't say where you are in the country, but if you're in Georgia, a good time to do that would be um, mid to late April. So I tend to do my top dressing in um, in the sorry, yeah, the late April, early May time frame. So um, if you can put that, those processes together, core aeration and then top dressing um, shortly thereafter, I, you're going to see some big benefits as far as um, as far as just the hard compacted clay soil you're dealing with. So I uh, so hope that helps. And then as far as your uh, your phosphorus, <clears throat> just use a fertilizer that has phosphorus in it. And then as far as organic matter, that's that's another reason why I'm a fan of using a blend when you top dress. Like there's some people that just only use 100% sand, which you can do, that's, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, but if you can get a 70-30 blend, which is what I've had really good results with in the past, uh, that way you get the best of both worlds. You get the leveling benefits of top dressing and you get the um, the introduction of more organic material from from the organic components. So um, if you're in Georgia, the the best top dressing material that already comes ready mixed that I I'm a big fan of is the stuff that Super Sod makes. It's their leveling mix. Um, they've given me a a link that I can give to you guys that will um, will save you. $5 off of whatever incentives they happen to be running. So if they're running a sale, you'll save additional $5 off of whatever sales that they are running. It doesn't cost you any, any more to do it. And as far as top dressing, um, again, it's by far the, the best stuff that I found that's that's readily available. Um, so I'll put a link there in the chat. Again, it only, it, it's only available if you're in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, some parts of Alabama, and then some parts of Tennessee. So I um, so hope that helps the everyday life. And you said your Bermuda is supposed to be H10, okay? Uh, next up is Gavin Moore. He says, hey, Ron, I have green mesh 
that is about one inch down in the soil all around my new home. Do you know what that might be? I don't. I don't. Is it? I don't know what that what that could be. Um, no, I, I I have no idea what it is. Um, is it something for like termite control? I don't. I have no idea. I, I guess some kind of insect control possibly, but I don't. I don't know, Gavin. Um, I am not sure on that one. It's a good question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next up, we have a, a super chat. Let me grab this one really quick. And this is from Mr. Theodore Nobles. All right. Thanks so much for that, Theodore. Super chat. For he says, what's up, Ron? Late to the stream, but I was wondering, can I put down Caravan G and fertilizer at the same time? And also, what is a good fertilizer for first feeding Bermuda grass in the great state of Georgia? Can you do them at the same time? Uh, on the same day, yes. At, this, like, at the exact same time, no, because the spreader settings are different. If you're gonna do that, Theodore, what I would say is do your fertilizer application first and then do your Caravan G application. So do anything with side in it, herbicide, fungicide, herb, herbicide, do those last. Like, oh, like do those and then get off the lawn. So do your fertilizer app first, follow it up with your um, insecticide, fungicide app in Caravan G and then water it in and you're good to go. As far as fertilizers, ones that I am a, fa a fan of for first feeding and Bermuda grass, I will show you. If you go to the golf course lawn store and you go to shop to our carefully curated lawn fertilizer section, and the fertilizer that I'm a fan of starting the season out with is this one. It's a high potassium fertilizer. It's the Stress 12 Zero 24. So I do this one for the first feeding of the season, and then I transition to Humic Max. So this is the fertilizer I use by far. Um, my lawn sees more of this than any other fertilizer, but I, I start the season out with uh, the 12024 and then Humic Max after that. So in my case, I've already done an application of this in March and then starting in April, it will be Humic Max all throughout the growing season until like September, October timeframe, at which point I will go back to the Stress 12024 and then put the lawn to bed for the year. So um, I'll send you a link to where you can pick um, either or both of those up. And if you have any other questions, uh, do let me um, do let me know. Theodore at Theodore Nobles. Um, let me get here at, at Theodore. Uh, there we go. So there you go. That's where you can get both of them. And I just saw here, Steve Jackson is in the live stream and he just said, um, you know, thanks for the assist, Steve. He said that the green mesh is from the sod farm. So I, I just saw here in another window that I have open. So that, that could be your answer as far as that, um, that mesh that you saw around your property. Thanks for that, Steve. I appreciate it. Okay, next up is finding out where I left off, which is always the hardest part after going and getting Super Chats, right? Okay, so next we have, um, uh, let's see here. We have Mary, I think. Uh, Mary J. I want to make sure I'm not, I'm not missing anyone because you guys tend to get upset whenever I do that. Uh, yeah, so Mary's up next. She says... Um, um, I need some Ron wisdom. My lawn is starting to stand out like a sore thumb in my neighborhood. It's starting to attract a few people being destructive, spinning tires. What would Ron do? Wait, wait, hang on a second. You have people, due to the domination that you're that you are asserting in the neighborhood, that they actually will come out and like run their drive their cars on your lawn. I, I, mean, I mean, all you can do is I mean get a camera, get a security camera and point it at the street and if you get their license plate, go and tell, you know, call, call the police and say, you know, that you, let's let you report it. Um, I mean, that really stinks. It really stinks that someone would do that, would do that to your lawn just as a, you know, as a way, as a, as a means of hitting back. But here's the thing, Mary, here's, here's a silver lining. And this is not going to help your problem, but it's a way to look at it. It's a way to, it's a perspective. Here's the thing. Being extraordinary will always come with haters. You're always gonna have people that are gonna come after you. In your case, unfortunately, it's people driving their car on your sidewalk or on the, on the lawn. Again, criminal offense in my opinion, but it's all par for the course. All they are doing is acknowledging the domination that you are, uh, that you're asserting in the neighborhood. I mean, what are you gonna do? You're gonna dominate less? You're gonna have your lawn look less good? You can't do that. I mean, we, we're not gonna co-sign that. So what I would say is get a security camera, point at the street, um, maybe even put a sign out there saying, you know, here, smile, you're on camera or whatever. Maybe that'll be a deterrent to people to stop being idiots and driving on your lawn, but it's just par for the course. Well, welcome, welcome to being exceptional at anything in life. You're always going to have people that are just not going to like you. And that's just, that's just the way it is. That's, um, 
That's that's bad. That's that's pretty nasty. I've I've had that happen to my lawn. Unfortunately, it's been it's been accidental. Like normally, delivery drivers, like Amazon drivers, have been pretty bad about driving on the lawn. You guys have seen videos of that. So um, I'm sorry you're dealing with it. I mean, it shows you're doing a lot of the right things, and just um, just keep moving on. Just just fix it. If there's ruts in it, get some you know top dressing area, patch it up, and just move on. Just keep just keep um, just keep going. You know what I mean? Nothing else you can really do. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't put too much energy into it. Uh, next up, you said um, Clave says I'm getting Poa annual infl uh, infiltration into my super sod yard. Cool season. Yeah, Clave. I, I like I was telling you, man. There's not. There's the, your best bet for Poa is to um, is to prevent it in a cool season long. Like in warm for warm season turf grass, we have um, we have this. We have certainty, which is awesome against Poa annual. Um, but you can't use this on your cool season lawn because it will, it'll do to your cool season grass what it does to Poa. It's going to injure and or kill it, right? So um, your best bet is just a good pre-emergent strategy in the fall to try and prevent as much of it as possible. And then for what, what you can start doing is start using um, growth regulator, regulator. Use like Primo to make it to where you don't, it doesn't show up as much, you know? So that's, um, that's the best I can, I can give you. Um, Mary says 95% of people will tell me it looks great, but there's always that one. And that's reflective of life. Like, think about it. Like 95% of the population are, are fairly decent people, but you think about it. Like it's, there's always that small percentage that messes it up for everybody. Like think about, think about all the stupid laws that we have in the world. It's not to, not to say prevent us to protect us from people like you and me. It's for all the, 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 the people that just have no, that, you know, have no home training. That, that's, that's what the, that's what the, it's there for. So, you know, 95%, um, that's a pretty good number. And all you can do is just ignore it. I mean, you know, again, put a camera up, you know, maybe put a sign saying, hey, you're on camera. Maybe that'll be a deterrent. But I mean, it's um, if you do anything, if you're good at anything in life, there's people that are not going to like you for it. And that's just the way it is. That's just consider it where it is a badge of honor, because that's that shows you you're doing something right. All right. Next up is Hoda Michael it says, hey, Ron, what is the best time to use protection from brown spots? OK, so you're talking about preventing like large patch brown patch in a lawn. So assuming you don't have a history of the disease in your, in your, in your property, Hoda, um, I am a fan of doing a preventative fungicide app in, um, the beginning of May and then another one in June. Now, if you have a history of, of large patch in your lawn, say earlier, let's say for example, you said, Hey Ron, you know, every April I get large patch in my lawn. It's, it's, a, it's a thing. In your case, you'd be putting down fungicide like now. You'd be putting down fungicide ahead of whenever it tends to, to manifest itself and be a problem in your lawn. Outside of that, I'm a fan of two fungicide apps, um, May and June, and then in the fall, two fungicide apps, October, November. Um, between those two for most properties, that's enough to keep to keep the diseases at bay. That coupled with making sure your equipment is sharp is um, and not over fertilizing, not doing things that, that tend to create conditions um, where disease can can um, can take root um, is normally enough to keep a lawn looking pretty good. So, uh, so hope that helps. Um, again, May, June is when I would, um, those are the months that I, I would do it. As far as fungicides for, um, for a large patch or brown patch, <clears throat> um, I've got, got two options for, there's more than two options, but the ones that I like, there are two that I like. Um, you've got liquid and you got granular and they both work well. If you like granular, go with Headway G. If you like liquid, go with Pillar SC. The nice thing about the liquid with Pillar SC is that this one bottle treats an acre, so 43,500 square feet, thereabouts, um, and, there's, and it's easy to apply. There's only one application rate for the liquid, which is one ounce, one fluid ounce per thousand square feet. Um, for Headway G, the application rate varies depending on what product you are, or what, um, what disease you're trying to treat. Um, I find that just over two pounds per thousand, a little over two pounds per thousand is a pretty good catch all rate for, um, for most common, for most of the problems that you're trying to, you're trying to prevent your lawn. So either one of these would be a great choice, um, on uh, just depending on which one you, uh, you prefer. If you like liquids, then go with uh, pillar. If you like granular, you prefer granular, then go with, um, with headway G. Um, and as far as, um, again, guidance, it, I'll show you something else too. Um, you may not know it, but on the, the store, under the resources section, we have a lawn care schedule that is free, free of charge. Anyone can, can use it. If you go to resources and lawn care schedule, and then you go to um, item five in the menu, which is monthly application schedule, um, here is a month-by-month -month breakdown of practices and products that um, that I I personally use and that um, that, that 
at this point, hundreds of people's views and they get really good results with. And you'll see that in the May timeframe, you've got your first spring, summer fungicide application. Um, but yeah, if you want something you can use as a basis, as a foundation for creating your program, uh, feel free to, to take a look at this and, and you know use the parts of it that you like, parts that you don't like, you don't have to use. Um, but this does this does work. It does produce a great a great result, assuming that you, you do your part, which is keep up with your regular mowing. So I'll put a link in the chat um, for you as well for that, Hoda. Um, and and hopefully that will um, will get you on the right path to a disease-free green lawn. All right, uh, let's up. Next up is B Butcher. It says, does too much P or K help to increase disease in grass? Or do I need to worry about that? Um, does it help decrease to disease in grass? Um, yeah, so I wouldn't, I won't say necessarily increases uh, disease butcher, but you don't, you, there's a, there's an optimal amount of, of all the nutrients, kind of like, just, just like how, like we, oh, there's certain amounts of like vitamin C is good for us, certain amounts of water that's good for us, certain amounts of iron that's good for us. It's the same thing for, for your, for the plant that's in your lawn, right? For the grass. As long as you stay within the recommended rates, within the recommended ranges, you're not going to really have a problem. Um, I would not, just like I, I would not over apply nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. I wouldn't over apply really any any nutrient um, because it's just ev eventually you're, you're creating conditions where um, where disease can take root if you if you if you do that. Um, the things, the way to help prevent disease out of your lawn um, are um, probably the probably one of the bigger ones is um, make sure you keep your equipment sharp. Because if you are, if you're tearing at the leaf, in other words, if you're, going, if you're done mowing your lawn, you go look at the, the edges and they're frayed or torn, you're just, you're, you're creating conditions where it's more likely for disease to take root. If you over fertilize, if you combine like excessive nitrogen um, and a lot of moisture and humid conditions that we have, like in the, the early spring, those can create conditions where, where disease can become a problem, which is why a large patch, brown patch tends to be a problem, um, earlier in the, uh, in the season. So as long as you fertilize your lawn, um, sensibly, right. Using the correct, the, the, the correct application rates, um, and you mow it with sharp equipment, you really shouldn't have too many problems with diseases. Uh, you know, a, a, a preventative fungicide app, I'm a fan of, especially if you're real mowing um, in the May, June timeframe. And that's really all you really should need. Um, so like, like anything else, if you, if you're applying it, if you are too much of anything is going, is going to produce adverse results, too much nitrogen, too much water, too much, um, for example, you, you do too much water, you overwater a lawn, um, you can create conditions where you can have disease issues. So it's not just P and K, too much of anything can create um can create problems. So um so I just wouldn't do that if that helps. So good question. Um, apply the appropriate amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Mow your equipment, your mow your lawn regularly with sharp equipment, and um, apply a preventative fungicide in May and June, and you should be you really should have problems with diseases in your um in your lawn. All right, next up is Gary. Cherix, Gary Cherix, he says, hey, Ron, my, my yard is a mess. Well, right side is it can only go up from here, right? He says, it's a mixture of grass types, but it is predominantly wild common Bermuda. I am considering trying to tame the wild Bermuda. Am I crazy for trying this? No. No, I mean, even common Bermuda, I mean, can look good if you mow it regularly, right? I mean, you can, it can look, look decent. Um, what I would say is this, is if you know that your lawn is primarily made up of, of um, Bermuda, Use a selective herbicide like Celsius to clean up, you know, the weeds that are in the lawn, like the broadleaf weeds, like get, get that cleaned up. And then you can really assess what you have. And once you start mowing it regularly, the Bermuda will begin to spread. You feed it, you know, a good diet of, uh, of nutrient. Um, the Bermuda will begin filling in and then you can decide, you know, if you, if you don't like the way the, the common Bermuda looks, you can, you can get rid of it. You can spray it out and then resod. Um, but um, but to answer your question, can common can a common Bermuda lawn look good? Yes, it can. If it's like um, the the big difference with common Bermuda is that the color, in my opinion, doesn't isn't as deep. It's not as as a deep green or even bluish as some of the some of the hybrids can have. Um, the leaf texture tends to be a little bit more coarse. It looks co like common Bermuda looks more like um. Not quite like Saint Augustine, but it's but it's, it's but it's a thicker. It's just not as it's not as pretty um, to most people as like a as like a hybrid. Um, but I would start with what you have. I would I would clean up what, clean up the weeds in your lawn, 
start regularly mowing it and then assess, you know, like say May, June time frame if you like how it's looking, how it's coming along. And if you don't, you can always, you can do a renovation. You can you can burn it all down, kill it off, and then resod. Um, you know, that that could be a strategy. But I, I would at least start with what you have and see um, and then decide from there. You're not crazy for trying to salvage your existing lawn. Because I, I don't think at this point you've really given it a fair shot because... You know, it's been, to your point, it's kind of a mess. It's got a bit of everything in there. So once you get rid of all the other trash, you can you can assess on, you can decide which way you want to go. All right, uh, next up <clears throat> is Zaki. He says, what's up, Ron? I just want to say that your content has taught me a lot as a new homeowner. Thanks for putting in all the work for the people. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Zaki. That really means a lot. Um, it is a lot of work, and I'm glad that it is, it is helpful uh, for you guys. All right, um... Let's see, we got, I'm broke. Um, all right, so next up we have um, Gary. He's back with another question or comment. He says, I did a blanket treatment of spectricide, weed stop, um, and crab, crabgrass killer. Okay, I know the one you're talking about. I think it's the orange bottle, I believe. I'm planning on putting down PGF complete and humichar soon. I am from Eastern Shore of Virginia, by the way. Sounds like a plan. Using the herbicides to kind of, Get everything cleaned up, and you're gonna go with a biostimulant and a fertilizer. I like it. I like it. I'm a big fan of that. I I endorse this. It's good. This is a good a good plan. Go forth and conquer. Um. Uh. Let's see here. He says. Um. Uh. Let's see here. Next up, we have. Um. Ricky Tiki Tavi. He says, uh, hey, Ron, thanks for hosting uh, these chats. I have Typhoon Backpack Sprayer, and I am looking for a good tip for to use for spot treating weeds like the RM43 or even Celsius Certainty. Thanks. So you have the Typhoon, you're looking... Okay, yeah, so the, so the spray tip that I would use... That's a good question. The spray tip that I would use for, for foliar sprays, which is Celsius and Certainty... Um, or for like which, which would qualify as is the um the foliar tip it's not really a foliar tip but this is the one that i, I call the foliar tip it's the fine droplet tip uh this is the one you're going to want to go with uh ricky uh so that one that is the one that i would um that i would use and then if you're looking for a spray tip for pre-emergent um, then I would go with, or any kind of soil-based products, I would go with this as um, for your flood jet tip. So the first one, the foliar tip is for your liquid fertilizers, your um, post-emergent herbicides, um, what else? Growth regulator, like those types of products. And then the flood jet tip are for like your fungicide, insecticides, and, um, and pre-emergent. Pretty much anything that needs to get in the soil, that is uh, the spray tip that I would, I would use. All right, uh, next up, um, uh, next up, you you have uh, Brian Hall. He says, uh, good evening, Ron. Um, it is almost springtime for Michigan 2024, and I'm excited. Nice, Brian. I like it. I like it. I like it. I dig it. Good good times. Good, good times. Uh, next up is Shiner Bach. Um, <laughs> just first of all, I think you're very handsome. Thanks. I appreciate it. Just love the show. Can you tell me if you're still using Arden 15 or if you change it something else? It's still Arden 15. Like what's in the lawn from years ago is still in the lawn now. So it's still, it's a blend of Arden 15 and Arden 15 Princess 77 and Tiffway 419. So it's not like it really goes away. It's still the same stuff that's been in there for years now. All right. Next up is Alan Colon Jr. He says, um, Ron, I am removing a small oak tree in the middle of, in, in the middle of my Bermuda lawn. Uh, the mulch bed beneath it is around 175 square feet. Would plugging from existing yard be smart to match? Yes. Yes. So you're so you're getting rid of an oak tree. You are, yeah, and you're trying to get, yeah, you're trying to get the area where the tree used to be to match your existing lawn. Yes, plugging would be the way that I would do that because that way you, you are guaranteed that once it all grows in, it's going to match. Um, if you go out and you get sod, uh, you, even if it's supposedly the same type of sod, you don't necessarily know that it's going to match, you know, perfectly with your existing, your existing lawn. So if you're patient, then plugging would be the way to ensure that where that oak tree used to be is going to match, um, is going to match perfectly. All right. Um, next up is simple cash offer. 
He says, um, hey, Ron, love the Friday shows. Should I remove my checkmate roller for the first few cuts of the season? I don't know what that what that is. Um, I'm not sure what that is and tell you you should remove it or not. Um, simple cash offer. Um, I don't know what that is, so I'm not I'm not sure. I don't remove if it's a front roller on a mower. I don't remove that whenever. I mean, that's obviously I don't remove that on my real mower whenever I mow. If it's a if it's a, a like some kind of a roller that sits behind a rotary mower, I mean, even then, I don't. I mean, I don't. I guess you could remove it, but I don't really see what I don't know what negative it would cause by removing it. You know what I mean? I don't know what the downside of removing it would be. Really, would be. All right. Um, uh, next up um, is. Uh, Brian Hall, he says, uh, Ron, when should I prep uh, slash clean up my, uh, start the, the spring prep slash clean up for my lawn here in Michigan? I'd say whenever you get, you're done with, uh, when you don't think you're going to have any more snow, whenever the frost is done, um, you know, you, that, that is when I would get out there and, uh, and do that type of work. I don't know. I don't live in Michigan, so I don't know when you guys, when like snow stops for you guys, but I would wait until, until then, you know, like when, I imagine it's going to be April at least. I imagine you guys are probably a month behind us at a minimum, um, and that's when you can do your um, your cleanup work. Begin, you know, begin mowing the lawn and and start doing doing all the things to get an awesome lawn this year. All right. Uh, next up is John Drill Wobb. He says, "Good evening, everyone. Ron, are you familiar with Country Club's eighteen zero eighteen? Would you consider that a slow release blend?" Um, I know of it. I don't. I don't know off the top of my head what the nitrogen makeup in it is to tell you whether it's slow release or not. The way you can tell is if you look at the label, um, the slow release, the slow release um, nitrogens in that fertilizer will have an asterisk next to them. Okay, so look for that if you see, and that will that would allow you to tell you that will that asterisk will will then go on, I think it's on all Lebanon fertilizers, it'll go to a note where it'll say like this percentage of the nitrogen is from slowly, like slow release nitrogen. So it'll tell you like what percentage of that 18% is, um, is slow release. So, um, so I'm familiar with it, but I don't know what percentage of, um, of the fertilizer is slow release nitrogen. All right. Um, let's up, next up we see here is, uh, two Trilla. He says, um, "Hey Ron, and happy Friday, everyone. I don't um, want, I don't uh, mean to be a jinx, but at the rate we're going, I'll be verticutting and applying biosimilants sooner than I expected. Uh, applying biosimilants, sure. Uh, verticutting, probably. I mean, probably a bit early for that, but um, but yeah, your lawn might be ahead, might be further ahead than um, you know, a lot of the other lawns out here. So, so yeah, biosimilants, sure, by all means, go for it. Uh, Gordon, let's see here." Uh, Gordon is up next. He says, uh, blah, 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 blah. he says, um, what are some affordable high and low P high K fertilizers? Um, you list some fertilizers at Lowe's, but all the first with K are 10 times at big box stores for 40 pounds. I don't know off the top of my head, man. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what are some other options. I don't, I don't know what the big box stores are carrying these days, um, to be able to tell you. So sorry about that, Gordon. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer to that because I don't, I don't know what they, what they have these days. All right, uh, and, and next up is Colin. He says, "Okay, cool. That's what I figured as well. Uh, definitely, we'll be focused on the main ones, the macros and micros for this year." All right, uh, let's see. Utah gets <laughs> you ought to get you. Ought, I get I should you there. You ought to. I think you're trying to say you to get you, you ought to get to me. He says. What fertilizer would you apply after scalping Bermuda? So um, what I use is the 12 24 That's what I used to start the season out with. Um, and then uh, if you, assuming your soil doesn't need phosphorus, then humic max. So, um, so these guys, I'll show you, I'll show you really quick here, uh, uh, Utah. So either um, this, or this, these are either one of those two. So the, the most correct answer would be from you getting a soil test. So you know whether or not you need a, a fertilizer with phosphorus in it or not. Um, and in that case, you would um, you would get, you would apply a fertilizer that matches what your, what the deficiencies are in your soil and apply that. So um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. And actually it's a good question because I'm sure I was gonna have that. So let me make a, let me make a, a note of that one really quick. It's a good question, Utah. 
Uh, next up is Jared George. He says, um, and actually this is a, this is an answer. Uh, Devin has an answer to um, to this. He says, he says, um, uh, Ron, what's up? Looking forward to some good turf talk. Um, just got hit with our third winter. That stinks. Uh, Twenty six inches of snow fell in a day and a half. That's craziness, man. That's a lot of snow in a day and a half. Can a guy get some sixty to seventy degree days? Not apparently where you are in Colorado, man. Apparently that's not really um, that's not 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 to be not to be in the cards, not to be in the cards for you, Devin. Um, but uh, but yeah, hope I guess maybe April, maybe next month, maybe next month you get some warmer weather. And uh, to answer your question, Gordon, um, Devin chimed in. He said you can get a forty six zero zero urea, very cheap for N, and then go for a separate zero zero twenty two K FERT, also reasonable, both in fifty pound bags if you can find them. So there you go. He's got you an option for nitrogen and for potassium. Um, so uh, so there you go. And uh, next up, we got Jared George. He says, "Hey Ron, our work team." Uh, a work team building trip had us make mini golf courses out of random stuff. That would be interesting. Um, I made sure to lay stripes on the green turf. Serious question though. How do I decide between sand leveling or a mix? Um, if you can do a mix, I would, I would, I really would. Um, Jared, because you, you get, if you look at, do like a 70% sand, 30% like topsoil or some other orga or compost, some other organic material, you get most of the benefits. You get like uh, the majority of the benefits of using sand from a leveling perspective and a drainage improvement perspective. Um, but then you're also introducing, you know, that organic material. So, so I really would, um, I really, I really would go for a a blend if you have the option. The only way I would go with 100% sand is if you just can't get that. If you can't get a ready mixed um, blend, then 100% sand is all you got. And even in that case, I would do like a heavy, um, like essential G or some other granular biosimilant prior to uh, laying down the sand. So, um, so I'm, I'm a fan of blends for those reasons. That is a good, a good question, sir. But uh, yeah. If all, if at all possible, 70, 30 mix is, um, is the way to go. In my opinion, for residential lawns. All right. Next up is, um, Vahid Navi, Vahid Navi. He says, um, uh, Diron, how can I change the structure of sandy soil when summer's arriving, uh, so, so hard and other things, hang on, let me start over. How can I change the, the, the structure of sandy soil when summer is arriving so I can, so it gets difficult and other things, my lawn is hundred percent dark green. Now I cut my lawn at the beginning of the week. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one, but he, you can't, I mean, there's not really an easy way to, to change. I mean, you can't really change like a, a lot of the soil profile, like maybe the, the top portion of it, the top six inches or so with top dressings, um, you know, several, several rounds of that, you can make adjustments, but as far as changing like the, the soil profile and mass, it's not really, that's not easy, uh, not easy to do. Um, so in your case, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, you probably wouldn't want to use, um, you probably wouldn't want to use a, a lot of sand in your top dressing, in your top dressing blend. So, um, but yeah, I'm sorry to have a better answer for you. There's, it's not, there's not an easy way to change, um, a, a large part of the profile. You can typically do like the, it's like six, six, eight inches or so, um, over, over several rounds over time. So good example. I can show you if you look at, um, where is this? If you look at this, if you look at the, um, what my profile looks like after years of, of top dressing, I've got, I've got one here. One of ours is replacing a sprinkler head in the back lawn. So if you look at that, that's about, eh, six, maybe seven inches. And you can see the, the bottom part, like the, the top of the cone, like the lower part is what the soil really looks like. And the upper portion is that's been changed over, over years and years of, um, of top dressing. So you could expect to make that kind of a change, but as far as like wholesale, um, which like what you have is what you have. All right. So hope that helps, sir. And good job on getting your mowing done earlier this week. Okay. Next up you have Mahid, uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> he's sorry, persistence on the topic, um, but I'm hoping we can settle this this uh, this dethatching, verticutting, power raking debate. What impact does turf raking, like the 
the prongs have on those runners. Not not bad, um, Mahi, um, Munir. I mean, again, the, the video, the live stream that I linked um, earlier, if you look at that, you can literally see what my lawn looks like after it's verticut, after it's turf raked, and then I do a mow afterwards. You can literally, you literally like show you like close-ups of different, like I just got done verticutting it. This is what it looks like. I just got through turf raking. This is what it looks like. The big thing is that is is to not go too aggressive. Um, Dethatching, again, for most lawns, I don't recommend it. Like most lawns don't really need that. Um, but as far as verticutting and, and power raking slash like turf turf raking, um, that those are practices that I am a fan of as long as you don't you're not too aggressive. So um, if you want to see, look earlier in the stream where I posted the live stream to um, to my um, to the to where I did all those all of those in one setting on a Saturday morning, and you can see for yourself the the difference that it that it makes. If you're if the question you're asking is it does it rip up and tear up and uh, the lawn where you have a bunch of runners sticking up all over the place? The answer is no. Okay, so next we have uh, Fahid. Um, Vahid, he says, for two weeks, the temperature was around 15 C. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, um, and next week, it's going to be cold. It's going to be down to negative two. So you think the lawn will get damaged? It's it's hard to say. I I, I doubt it, Vahid. Anything that you get is, is going to likely be temporary. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about it, especially if it's only going to be for a short period of time. It should be okay. No Name is up next. He says, hey, Ron and fellow lawn enthusiasts, it's been a week for me. Looking forward to some great turf talk. Let's get those likes up. Yeah, guys, we have, well, we're doing pretty good on likes. We got 140 people in the live stream right now, 158 likes, so we're doing pretty good. But if you've not hit the like button yet, uh, definitely do that. It costs you absolutely nothing. Free way to support the channel. And then next up is Taylor Riley. He says, before top dressing, do you reset the lawn back to half an inch? Also, once that sand is down, does your watering schedule change? And if so, what does it look like? Thanks for everything. Great question, Taylor. Um, if I'm at three quarters of an inch, I don't change the height of cut. I leave the lawn where it is. That's, that's fine for um, for top dressing. Um, it's not not a bunch of work to work the material in the soil if into the lawn if the, um, the height of cut is at uh, 0.75 inches. Um, as far as watering schedule, the days after top dressing, I do run irrigation for the, like I do run irrigation every day for the first three days or so after um, after doing a top dressing. And if you wanna see, I've got a video actually on this. It's actually like what comes next after top dressing. So I am going to, um, I'm gonna, yeah, here we go. This is a video that um, from like three years ago that answers this very topic. Like after you got through top dressing your lawn, what are some things you should do uh, afterwards to help it recover faster? And it's a really short video and I think you'll get some, some value out of that. So this is, um, that's the one that you should watch. And pretty much what I say is you, you know, water, water um, the days afterwards. If you have a leveling rake, if you have a leveling rake, um, run like you drag use that like drag it over the lawn because that's going to help that's going to help the material settle in a bit better and also help the grass the tips of the grass blades to be exposed it's going to recover faster and i think the other tip in there is to um to raise the height of cut of your mower up just a little bit so you don't get into the sand and have to send it in for a sharpening i think those are the three tips but um it that video is like over three years old so watch it really quickly and you'll see what i'm talking about all right um Let's up next up is um Losindo Nava says, is there a better post emergent for Bermuda other than blind side? Uh yeah, yeah. It depends on what you're trying to control, Losinda, but for Bermuda grass, um, for broadleaf um weeds, I am a fan of Celsius. Like this is what I I this would be my go-to. In other words, if I can only have one herbicide for use on a Bermuda lawn, it would be Celsius. Because this, this cleans up the majority of what you're gonna come across in in Bermuda, as far as broadleafs anyway. And then for sedges and poannua, um, the other one I'd recommend is this product called Certainty. So between these two, um, this provides pretty good control of the majority of the weeds you're gonna have in a Bermuda lawn. And the nice thing about these is there's not really any labeled temperature restrictions. What that means is that you can spray them when temperatures are cooler and you can spray them when it's summertime and the chances of you injuring 
the lawn are far far less um, than what you would have if you spray like a um, like a three way like a like a two four D or some any kind of three way product. So um, I'm a fan of these like Celsius and Certainty as far as um, as far as herbicides to use on a warm season a warm season lawn. So if you're interested in those, I'll um, I'll send you a link of where you can pick where you can pick those up um, here. So hope that helps. Uh, Lucinda, if you need anything else, uh, let me know. Blindside's a good is a good um a good post emergent herbicide as well too. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a fan of Celsius and and Certainty. All right, next up is John Williams. He or your Jonathan Camarado. He says, "Happy to report that my fall and spring pre emergent products have worked well on my Bermuda in Oklahoma. Thanks for the great products. Awesome, Jonathan. I'm glad to hear that. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome." Um, yeah, it's amazing what like a well-timed pre-emergent app will do as far as not, you know, not reducing the amount of weeds you're gonna have to deal with in your lawn. So I'm glad that it uh that it worked out for you. And then next is John Williams. He says, <clears throat> Hey Ron, appreciate the consistent content. Love the profession on professional lawn care. Um, I just put down some centipede grass seed and put some Milo with it. Um, what amendments should I do next? Will this seed come up? Okay, so you did some centipede grass seed, you put some Milo down, so you've already fertilized it. What amendments should I do next? Um, if you wanna use a granular biosimilant like um, like Essential G, that would be good, John. Um, you've already put the grass seed down, so carbonized PN, um, like I don't want you, the thing with carbonized PN, while, while it's a great product, I would not use that now since you've already put the seed in, because to, to, to spread it, you need like a leveling rake and you could disturb the grass that's the, the the seed that's trying to root in or trying to germinate and grow in. So I wouldn't do that. So um, of the two, if you're starting over from scratch, then I would say do carbonized PN and do a, a layer of that over the entire lawn and put your grass seed down, rake it in and go on your way. But since you've already done that, I would say essential G because this is just a granular biosimilant that you can just, you can throw in your broadcast spreader and just, you know, you can make a pass over the lawn and that that is gonna help the, um, the lawn to establish a bit faster. But outside of that, just patience, just time. It sounds like you did a lot of the right things. You put down a fertilizer, you did your grass seed. I'm assuming you did a good job doing your preparation. As long as you're putting water on it, just give it time and then it, you know, it should um it should grow in. I've never grown um centipede from grass seed. I don't even know you I didn't even know that you that you um I know there I don't know as far as centipede grass seed, I've never even looked into it to know what's even available or to know what you can expect as far as like how long it takes to germinate. Um, so, um, but yeah, the only thing I would say outside of that is a good granular biosimilant like uh, like Essential G at this point. All right, next up is Tom Hoffenkamp. He says, happy Friday, y'all, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Celebrate the green. Definitely, definitely Tom. So yeah, this is Tom's lawn. He was one of the uh, lawns earlier. I was showing you guys from the green up. You can see right there, there's his lawn coming in. And uh, yeah, enjoy the green. Uh, next up is um, uh, Jared. He says, Ron, that what you said about herbicide use was really insightful and it sounds like common sense, but I think everyone, everyone, myself included, benefits from hearing that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to herbicides, I mean, they they look at them as a tool. It's not something you should really, at least post emergent herbicides anyway, you shouldn't regularly be like, be broadcast spraying your lawn with that stuff. You really, it really should not be necessary if you're doing all the other things properly. You know what I mean? So if you are, um, you know, if you're mowing properly to where you're encouraging the lawn to, to, to grow in using a good, good fertilizer, um, again, a thick, healthy lawn is a great deterrent for, um, for, for weeds. You know, that's a, that's a great, a great option. So that's, that's what I would, um, I would say to, to, to do. All right, Gary Cherick says, in your opinion, certainty or halo or house or halo for um, sage, sedges. So halo select, I believe, is a generic version of sedge hammer. So if you're asking between sedge hammer and certainty, I'm a fan of certainty. Uh, certainty works faster. It controls more sedges. Um, it controls more stuff. Um, and yeah, and it also controls poannua. So that's another thing too. So certainty controls more, more weeds um, and it's faster and it also controls poannua, which um, um, sedge hammer does not. So for those reasons, I am a fan of certainty over, over, um, over sedge hammer. I would, now where sedge hammer makes sense is if you have a cool season lawn, then yeah, go with that because you can't use certainty on, 
on cool season turf grass, but if you got Bermuda, I would um I would opt for certainty over over sedgehammer. All right. Um let's next up we have John Williams. He says, I have a centipede lawn in Savannah. Can I apply Celsius at this time? Thanks. Yeah, you can. I mean, again, kind of like the the theme I was talking about with Jared, if you're using it to spot spray weeds here and there, that's fine. I mean, I I unless there's a reason for it. Um, which really shouldn't be an lawn that's been been taken care of. You shouldn't need to broadcast spray the entire lawn with this stuff. So yeah, for spot spraying, that yeah, shouldn't be a problem at all. The only warm season turf grass of memory serves me that you can't that you're not supposed to spray certainty on, or Celsius on rather is um, is Bahia grass. But like centipede, Saint Augustine, Bermuda, Zoysia, um, those are all fine. Those are all good to go. Um, uh, next up. Um, we got uh, Jacob just saying, what's up, Stripe Action Squad, rain all day here in Arizona. That's nice. You got to take it when you can get it, right? Hoping to get my mows in on Sunday. And then uh, next up, um, bah, 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 bah. he says, John Williams says, I have a tree, lots of tree roots in my ground. Is it possible to grow a good lawn in these conditions? The trees are from off my property. If not, what can I do to grow a beautiful thick lawn? Yeah, I mean, if you've got, so if you've got like a fence and a neighbor right next to you has a big tree and the roots for that tree are over on your property, um, it's going to be difficult to grow, to grow a nice lawn there. Um, you may have to, you, know, you may have to just do something decorative, put some shrubs or something else in there. But but if you've got big tree roots from like a neighboring tree that you don't have any control over, like you can't cut it down, you can't, you, know, you can't get rid of the roots. Um, then I'd say just make that area, like do something else in that area that's decorative versus, um, you know, versus versus really trying to go after, um, trying to grow grass there. Because the thing that I would, I, would, I would imagine, John, is that if the roots are big enough in that area that is causing a problem, um, it's, that means the tree's probably not too far away. So you, you, it might not be the roots that's causing you to have difficulty growing grass as much as the shade that that tree is um is casting in the area you know what i mean so the answer still doesn't change if you can't get rid of the tree if you can't figure out a way to to to, to get more sunlight in that area then it's going to be um just put do something else there that looks nice that's not grass so um sorry i don't have a better answer for you but if if, if grass is not growing there there's a reason why it's not growing so you can try but i don't i don't think it's i don't think you're gonna have a whole lot of success with it uh, next up is Noek95. It says, um, what's up? Um, what, what do I do? I wanted to fertilize yesterday, but the 10-day forecast shows a cold front. What are the negative effects of fertilizing before, before cold fronts? It depends on how much of a cold front you're talking about. If you're talking about like one day where it's cold, it's not that, not that big a deal. But if you're talking, you know, like what we had last year, um, you know, where the, you know, I think in this March last year, we had like a week of really cold weather um, where the lawns around Georgia were greening up and they started to go dormant again because of how cold it is. That like fertilizer doesn't really have a play a big role in that as much as just the, the weather. So in other words, if you fertilized, if you say you were in Georgia and you fertilize, you already fertilized your lawn and you're going to have a day or two next week where it's going to be like in the forties or something. It's not nothing I'd really, nothing I'd really worry about. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I, I honestly really wouldn't worry about it. I mean, the lawn, the, the, the grass will slow down a little bit during the time when it's, when it's cold, but if it's only, if it's temporary only for a couple of days, it's not going to, um, it's not going to, not going to have any long-term effects as far as what's going to happen, um, throughout the rest of the season. So if you want to wait till afterwards until the cold snap passes, I'm not, again, I'm not sure where you are or for how long it's going to be cold in your area. If you want to wait till after that, that would be fine too. Um, but if, if it's all right, the fertilizer is already down, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it. Okay, next up we have um, Abraham Soto. He says, good evening, Ron. What pre-emergence would I have to use if I want to have all your coverage applying every three months granular products. Uh, I mean, you could, I guess you could rotate between um, prodiamine and dithiapyr. You could, you could, you could, there's tons of different options. Cause I think like spectacle is available as a granular uh, dithiapyr comes in a granular prodiamine runs and it comes in a granular. So you can rotate between those if you wanted to. Um, if you, if you live somewhere where you think that you need to use pre-emergent every, um, every three months, 
Um, I guess maybe if you're in Florida or something, but I mean, around around here, twice per year. In other words, in Georgia, twice per year is enough to um, to get good results. Once in the spring, once in the fall. But for, again, to answer your question, between um, prodiamine and dithiapir, you should be able to to be able to rotate um, between them every every three months and not exceed uh, the annual limits by um, by doing that. Uh, let's see here. Um, next up is Fresh Apples. It says, what about certainty doesn't work well against Poanua? Um, it does work well against Poa. The big, the big challenge that people have with it when they're using it to control Poa is if they don't spray it at the correct rates. So if you, the label for certainty for Poanua calls for um, 1.25 ounces. So one large scoop on the low end of the rate for controlling Poa and it calls for two of the large scoops on the high end. So between 1.25 ounces per acre up to two ounces per acre. Um, what I've found is that if you have young poannua, like, like baby poa, um, the, the lower end can work well. But this time of year where poa is more established and it's already starting to flower, you have to bump the rate up to get, to get good control out of it. So um, what I've been telling folks and what I've also you know, experienced through my own testing is like one large scoop and two small scoops of certainty produces a good result with against Poanua uh, this time of year. So you do that, add some um, surfactant with it, and you're going to get a good result with um with controlling um with controlling Poa. So um so hope that helps. Um, it does work. The, big, the biggest problem people have is they just don't they don't spray at the right rates, and because of that, they don't get um they don't get um good control out of it. So hope that helps. Fresh apples. Um, if you're trying it, try bumping that rate up and uh, use some surfactant and you should, um, you should get a, a better result. Should get a better result. All right. Um, moving on is, yep. Yeah, so the same thing from Steve Jackson. Steve is saying the green mesh is from the roll. Mary also says the green mesh is probably left over from the, um, straw erosion, uh, roll. Cool. Thanks for that guys. And next up, uh, we have um, Fresh Apples says, it says, hey, Ron, uh, three quarters of my lawn is poannua. I got some crabgrass and a, ton, and a ton of thatch. It's so stiff I can barely rip up the thatch. What products should I treat the weeds with and got any advice? Yeah, so I, I would be... I would actually be careful and make sure you, that you identify what you really, what you have in your lawn. Um, like it's a bit early in the season for crabgrass to really be, to really be a thing. I mean, maybe if you're, if you're in South Florida, maybe, but I mean, um, you know, poa, yes, crabgrass, I, I wouldn't think that you'd be seeing that uh, this time of year. So um, if you're, like I said, with poannua, if your lawn is really, Bermuda or some other warm season grass type, um, you could use certainty to, to clean it up. But I mean, it's um, I I would I would make sure that you identify what weeds you actually you actually have because also when you say that three quarters of your lawn is poa, then what kind of grass? Um, I mean, you, it might be easier honestly in your case if three quarters of your lawn is just all weeds um, and it's all poa to. You, to use like a non-selective herbicide, use something like glyphosate just to clean that up, and then and just resod. You know that might that might be the way to go. Because I mean, I don't have a picture of your lawn; I can't see it. Um, but based on what you're describing, it sounds like your lawn is more weeds without any particular grass in it. So you may not want to you know spend the money on a on a post-emergent herbicide because you're not really trying. There's not really a grass you're trying to protect. You know what I'm saying? You, you mainly you mainly just got weeds you're trying to get rid of. So perhaps in your case. A renovation would be the way to go, and in that case, you could just use something less expensive like um, like glyphosate to clean up to clean up the existing weeds in your lawn. All right, uh, next up is Etten Rake. Um, I think and Rake says, "Hey, Ron, I have a drainage issues on my lawn, all around the house that is especially bad in the backyard with standing water for days. How do I determine how much topsoil I need?" I mean. You find out what the low, you find out what the low spot is and measure, you know, measure, just do a measurement. And, and then from there you can, you can determine how much, how much you need to build up that, that particular area. Um, what you could do is you could take a, um, take like a piece of string 
and like put it on like you know nail like in a stake or screwdriver or whatever and stick it in one end of a part of the lawn that is like the level you want it to be and go across like pretty much you want to span the the dip the area where the water kind of settles and pools and by by doing that you'll be and sticking a ruler taking a ruler and measuring how much further down um, from the string to the surfaces that gives you an idea of how much material you're going to need to build up that area to um, to correct the the drainage problem. Um, but the thing is, depending on how bad it is, it might be worth it to bring a professional in. You know what I mean? Because the thing is, if you if you just go in there and just dump a bunch of topsoil in that in that one spot, you might just be moving the problem somewhere else. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that if you when you're fixing the drainage problem you are you're designing it with a with a an idea of where you want the water to go so where it leaves the property you know what i mean it's not just filling in the dip you also want to think about like where do i want all this water to go once i um once i get rid of this this low spot so if it's a, if it's a severe um situation like it sounds pretty severe you got water standing there for days it it might not be a bad idea if for anything just to call someone in and that that does that for a living and get their thoughts of saying hey if you were going to fix this how would you go about it even if you just had to do the work yourself even if you have to pay them for a couple of hours of their time to come out there and give you some some advice um that way you'll be going forward with like um you know like like some actual guidance from someone that that's actually seen what you're dealing with and and not not creating another problem for yourself by just um dumping a bunch of topsoil there to try and fill in the uh fill in the dip so, um, so hope that helps, um, Ed and Rake. But again, a, a string spanning the the low area, you can measure. You can see how 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 much you're what you're dealing with. But again, if it's that bad, it would it's probably worth bringing a professional in to have them look at it and and say, well, you know, we can we can build this up, but we gotta put a little bit of a swale in here so we can we can kind of channel the water to go this direction so we can drains out to the street because or, or otherwise you're just again you're just gonna be moving the water around. You're just gonna be moving it from one spot to another spot, which you probably don't want. All right. Uh, next up is uh, um, so we got um, Ian uh, Michal. He says, "No matter um, what I do every year, I can't beat the wild onion in my lawn. It seems to always pop up when soil temps are well below 55 degrees. Any suggestions? Working with a cool season grass, mainly rye. Um, you know, I think Ian. I think that triad." Like a th like most three ways will take care of wild onion. I think. Let me let me look here really quickly. I don't want to give you bad advice. Let me look here really quickly. I I want to say that wild onion is on the label, and in that case, you you could you and and try it can be used on ryegrass. I'm pretty sure it can be used on on cool and warm season grass. And yeah. Uh, well, 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 yeah, here we go. Yeah. So what I'm looking at right now, this is, um, the label for triad and you can see that, yeah, it's, you're good to go on ryegrass and that it is labeled for controlling wild onions. So I would give this a shot. I would give this a shot. I'll, um, I'll send you a link of where you can, um, of where you can pick that up. Um, use a little bit of surfactant with it. Um, but that is what I would, I would try. That's a good question as far as pre-emergent. I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know if, if prodiamine or if, um, if prodiamine is, is labeled for controlling or preventing wild onion. That's a good one. I don't know the answer to that, Ian. But if you're looking to get rid of it after the fact, you can um, look into, into this, into try it or really any, any other three way they should, I mean, they're all, they, they're all fairly similar, um, but you can look at, look at that product and you get that or find something similar to that that uh, should do a good job with getting rid of the uh, the wild onion in your in your cool season lawn. All right, um, Mary says not an option to go less. I'm reminded that golf courses have people who do that do donuts on it every now and then. Yeah, I think I think Dem was telling us about that. They had some case where somebody like drove a golf cart into a, a trap or something crazy. So I mean, some people have different, have weird senses of humor, man. So. All you can do is just, um, whatever, just, just let it, let it go. I mean, just, it's not worth it. Uh, let's see here. Tipsy Tiger says, um, my first time joining the live stream. Welcome. He says, this is my first year treating my lawn. I put down prodiamine and triplet in February. What's my next move? Another round of herbicides in the spring, 20,000 square feet. Um, what are you trying? What, what, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? So if you did your pre-emergent, that's good. Um, if you have weeds in your lawn, then yes, you would use a post-emergent herbicide to control them. But if not, I would say 
do a soil test and then, you know, get a quality fertilizer and start feeding the lawn based on your soil test results. That's what I would, um, that's what I would say to use a, a tipsy tiger. Um, yeah, I mean, you've already, you did pre-emerge it, which is great. Um, and, um, I, unless you need it, I wouldn't go out and, you know, blast the entire lawn with, uh, with herbicides. I would begin fertilizing it and mowing it and, um, and just go from there. Um, Devin is chiming in. He says, uh, Mary J, we have vandalisms on the green, um, two every summer. Never fails. We fix it and go on with business as usual. Donuts in the greens, driving over flag sticks, and the list goes on. Fix it and keep going. Yep, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, not, it's just not worth expending the energy, honestly. I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it too much. Um, like I said, if you want, if it really becomes like a constant problem, like install a security camera, and then, I mean, that might be a deterrent to make them, um, to make them stop. All right. Uh, next up is Tito. He says, if you have mostly dirt in the backyard, but there's some Bermuda, do you fertilize just the grass or also the dirt? Um, I mean, is it, are you trying to, so you have a black lard, it's mostly dirt and you're trying to get the Bermuda to grow in there. I mean, what I would do is this, I would fertilize all of it and I would transfer plugs from the parts of the lawn where the Bermuda is doing well into the areas that are mostly dirt. And that way you can, you're going to encourage that, that, that to fill in faster. Unless, I mean, unless you're telling me, <coughs> unless you're telling me that you just want that area to stay dirt. I mean, if it's, if the, the goal is to keep one part of the lawn, just bare dirt, then no, you wouldn't fertilize it. But if the goal is to get the entire thing to be grass, then I would fertilize it and transfer plugs into it. And that that's going to, that's going to help speed up that process. So it depends on what you're after Tito. I think it's the latter where you want the entire thing to be grass. And if that's the case, you would, um, you would fertilize all of it. Next up is Wes Parker. He says, do you typically cut and then apply PGR or apply and then a day and then cut a day or so later? Yeah. So I will, um, I'll apply growth regulator <coughs> and then I will mow. So what I will do is if I, if I'm gonna do um, spray um, PGR, I will I will typically mow the day before, um, spray my growth regulator and and other the concoction, other biostimulants and fertilizer, and then not and then not mow for another day or so. So, um, the if your answer is, I would if you had to pick, I would mow and then apply growth regulator. I would not apply growth regulator and then mow right after that. You want you want to you want to give it time to be absorbed. Um, into the plant, if that's what you're, if that's what you're asking. So yes, cut and then apply PGR would be the way that I would, um, I would do it. West Parker. Good question. Um, uh, Dry Hazzy says, uh, da, 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 da. I don't know. He says, evening, Ron. Town repaved the road, and now I have small rocks all over the apron on my lawn. Any thoughts on how to deal with it? Just get them off. You just gotta, you just gotta, you get, you rake them out. That's it. That's all you can. That's all you can really do. Um, you know, that's all you can really do. I would just, I would just get, I mean, obviously don't leave them there to where you can take the risk of damaging your mower if you try and mow, mow over them. So I would just get a rake and, and rake them out. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you can, you can call the city and say, Hey, you guys did this and you caused a big mess. Can you guys come clean it up? They I probably kind of doubtful, but it's worth a shot. They say, no, you're no worse off than you are right now. Right. But regardless, I would get rid of the debris. I would get rid of the stones and, asphalt or gravel or whatever it happens to be in your um in your lawn and then stan says the checkmate roller is a striping roller you attach to your mower cool yeah okay um in in i still still stands i don't know why you would necessarily need to remove it um I've, I've never used one but i can't see why it would be a problem if you're um if you're mowing your lawn for the first mow of the season why you'd want to why you need to get rid of it um let's see here tom hovenkamp is up next he says um, hey, Ron, how strong of a FERT can I mix with biospectrum? Does it matter? Would ammonium sulfate be okay? I, I imagine it would be fine, Tom. I've never tried it. So all the fertilizers that are on the golf course lawn store that are foliar sprays, so like, um, so Bloomplex, Turfplex, um, Release 901C, obviously, Nutrizolve, I've, I've sprayed all of those. I mixed all those with biospectrum and there's not been really any problems. I don't imagine you'd have a problem um, mixing it with an ammonium sulfate either. Um, what you could do is just create, a, get a, do a jar test, get like a small amount and just test it and see, make sure nothing weird happens. I don't think you're going to have a problem. 
Um, I don't think you're going to have an issue with it. I've never seen it react with anything like where cause like, you know, crazy foaming or anything like that. It just, um, it, it tends to play, play pretty nicely with, um, with liquids. And then Tom says, um, Miramichi mentions mixing it with furt, but I do not want to hurt my microbes. No, yeah, it's, it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, I, again, literally every time I, I don't, I'm trying to think if I've ever sprayed biospectrum just by itself. Pretty much every time I've sprayed it, it's been with a fertilizer. So, um, yeah, there's no, no issues with doing that. The only thing I would not, I probably wouldn't mix with biospectrum and spray is like fungicides. Like I wouldn't mix it with fungicides. Um, but fertilizer, um, no, no problems with that at all. All right, next up is Morgan Hobbs. He says, hey, Ron, I live in Palm Beach, Florida with St. Augustine Lawn that I have nursed back to health over the three years. Looks great now, but I want it thick like some of the neighbors. What would you do? Um, so I would feed it and I would mow it. That's what I would do, Morgan. So, you know, a good, I would get a soil test done. I would get a soil test done because that's going to tell you which fertilizer is the best particular fit for your soil. And I would fertilize the lawn based on that. And then I would just make sure your mower's sharp and mow it regularly. Because as you, the more you know, frequent mowing stimulates growth, that's going to cause the lawn to thicken up and, and get it looking really nice. Um, if you can also intro, um, incorporate a biostimulant program, like I'm a fan of, um, of Essential G. It's a great product. So I would, um, I would consider doing that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, really it comes down to a good nutrient program and regular mowing is, um, is that's how you get a great lawn. That's the, uh, it's, it's really not complicated. It's just, you have to just do those things for, um, consistently. And then for, uh, and over time, you just can't help but have a great looking stand of, uh, of turf grass. So I'm going to send you a link here where you can find the soil test kits, um, there that's soil test kits. And then as far as fertilizer options, I'm going to send you this here. So there, uh, there you go. So between those two and regular mowing, you, it's going to be pretty hard to not have a great looking lawn. All right. Uh, next up is Brad Greyer, I think. Uh, he says, I don't know what you're asking here. Um, he says, um, Hey, Ron, I heard you mention the plugs for filling in the area where the shoes were moved. I did uh, the same this week, and I've applied some masonry sand for leveling. I have Tipway 419 as well. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that you see where plugs aren't available, only sod. Yeah, so when I say using plugs, I would transfer plugs from your existing lawn. I'm not talking about getting plugs from like a sod farm. Like if you're going to get sod, if you can get plugs from a sod farm, you may as well just get the sod. Um, the, the idea is that by using by transferring plugs from your existing lawn, then you know it's absolutely gonna match. Whereas if you go get, you know, whether you get sod or you get like, get a piece of sod and you, you plug it, use it to create plugs, um, or you get you get plugs from, from a sod farm, you can't really use sod to make plugs. But I'm just, you get, you get what I'm saying? If you're bringing grass in that is, that is not already in your lawn, you run the risk of it not matching your existing lawn. So when I say plug your existing lawn, I, I by that I mean, from your, take the plugs, get the plugs from your lawn, from the parts of your lawn that are doing well, that are healthy, get plugs from there and transfer them to the areas that you're trying to get to fill in, to fill in faster. Which I think is what you meant um, ba based on your, your first comment about, uh, you know, about Tipway 419. So I think that's, I think that's what you were saying. All right. Uh, next up is Joe Cox. He says, um, good evening. Back in 2023, I dethatched my lawn and now Half my yard is bare. I sprayed pre-immersion on February 20th. When can I reseed or should I try to use sod? The air is about 12,000 square feet. So if you sprayed pre-immersion, um, yeah, less than a month ago, you're not going to be using seed really if you want good germination for like three to four months, more closer to the four month, four month range. Um, if you want to use sod, yeah, that would be a way to go, Joe. Like that you're going to have better success with than trying to, to, grow your, um, to, to fill in your, your lawn from, from seed. So if you, yeah, given that you have 12,000 square feet, sod is what I would look into. If you're trying to have the lawn, um, you know, if you're trying to get it established this year, look into, uh, look into sod. Grass seed is not going to be a go for you. Next is, um, Eden Rica. He says, Hey, Ron, is it too early to do an aggressive hard kill now, or should I wait for the Bermuda to become more active? My lawn is 80% weeds. I'm in Georgia. 
Um, if the if the Bermuda is greening up, um, then you can go after it. I mean, worst case you can do is if you <coughs> if you blanket if you like use the um, use glyphosate over the entire lawn now, weeds included. Um, that at least is going to get the weeds gone, and then you know if you have to do another round a few weeks from now to get rid of the Bermuda, that that would be fine too. Um, it depends on how on how. Um, how much your Bermuda is greening up. If it's still largely dormant, using glyphosate is not gonna have the best results versus whenever it's growing in. In other words, if your lawn looked like how my front lawn looks now, if it looked like that, um, then yes, using glyphosate is gonna work really well for cleaning that up. If it looks, if it's more, dor if it's dormant much more than that, then maybe give it another, a couple of weeks before you decide to do the renovation because that way you're gonna get, you know, the, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get a better result with the, um, with the, with the, your, your, your kill off process. So, so I uh, hope that helps. Good question. And he says, Rick Stice says, can you put down pre-emergent and post-emergent on the same day? Yes. Yes, you can. You can put them down the same day. You can put them down at the same time if you want to. So if you wanted to say, say you had a Bermuda lawn and you were trying to use prodiamine to, as your pre-emergent, and you're also trying to control existing weeds in your lawn, so you're trying to clean up the existing weeds and also get out a pre-emergent, you can mix prodiamine, Celsius, and certainty and spray it all at once. Um, and it, that produces a pretty good result. If you decide to do this, the only uh, thing I would tell you is you're going to want to wait a day or so before you run irrigation because you want to give the post-emergence enough time to dry on the leaf of the plant so they can work better. And I'm also a fan, if you're doing that, if you're mixing um, prodiamine, Celsius, and certainty uh, to a mitt surfactant. Um, but outside of that, you can get a good result mixing post and, po post and pre emergent herbicides and spraying them on the same day, really at the same time, if you wanted to. It's a good, great question, uh, Rick. And, um, and hopefully that gives you what you need to be able to. Uh, sounds like, sounds like get that lawn that's, that's, that's kind of misbehaving, getting it under control. So, a uh, good question. All right. Uh, Next up is Edward Beasley. He says, hey, what's up, Ron? When would you be having your spring sale? Uh, thanks for all the help throughout the years. Um, I don't know. Probably, I don't have any, any plans to have one. Um, we did one um, for um, uh, Black Friday last year, but during the spring, um, at this point, there's not really any plans for for a spring sale. But if I do, you you guys will know. I'll, I'll announce it here on the live stream, but at this point, I don't have, I don't have any kind of dates or any plans for, for anything like that. All right, uh, next up we have Demarculus Thompson. He says, greetings, Ron and Stripe Action Crew. How soon after a fungicide app should I start adding biospectrum to the lawn? You could you could start doing it like the next time you spray liquids, um, um, Demarculus. So if you, if you did like a fungicide app at the beginning of the month and the next time you're gonna spray is on the 15th, you could throw some biospectrum in the tank then and you'd be you'd be just fine. All right, um, next up is Corey Caswell. He says, I've been subscribed to your channel forever about a week ago and I just realized I wasn't subscribed anymore. I fixed that, keep it up. Thanks for that, Corey. Yeah, I think YouTube every now and then periodically goes through and if you haven't been watching the content or you haven't been as active whenever they show videos, they they might like prune, like they might prune, like prune your subscriber list. Um, so yeah, if you find that you're not subscribed, just, um, just do what you did, resubscribe, re hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever I post something. And uh, just keep it moving. No. Um, next up is Ian Michal. He says, I haven't been able to find a verticutter to rent here in New England. I have about 3,000 square feet of zoysia that is three years old and it's never been verticut. Any suggestions? Power rake? Uh, yeah, you could. You can power rake it. Um, another option, but you gotta be really careful if you decide to do this to go this route, is if you can find a slit seeder a slit seeder and then set it up properly to where it's not, you set it up high to where it's not like carving a channel into the soil. So pretty much you're not using it to seed, you're using it more as like a verticutter. That can work, um, but that's outside of getting an actual verticutter, um, which it sounds like you can't find one, you can use a slit seeder as like a poor man's verticutter. But again, you have to raise it up because those, they're they're designed um, like the the, the, the height that it's going to be set at when you get it from a rental place is going to is going to be set such that you're 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 putting um, channels like light 
like channels in the soil. And we really don't want to do that whenever you're verticutting. So if you can find a slit seeder and you can adjust it to where you can raise it up to where the blades are, um, you know, not you're not carving huge channels in the in the in the turf, then uh, you are you can use that. So I uh, hope that helps, Ian. Um, yeah, verticutters are kind of tough to come by. I mean, another thing you can do too is you can get one of those. Um, those Sunjos, like the Sunjo electric powered ones, you can find them on Amazon. Uh, you can use that for verticutting as well too. Like those, there's people that, that verticut and turf rake using those. So that might be an option and you don't actually have to rent it and they're not really that expensive. So, and then you'll own one, right? So um, so look into like a, a Sunjo, um, like turf power rake slash uh, verticutter. They have like an interchangeable cartridge that you can swap back and forth depending on what you're you're trying to do. All right, James Sinor says, um, Ron, loving my new earth and turf as seen in the group. Yeah, dude, that, that's a pretty hard flex, having your having a, an earth and turf uh, 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 spreader. That's pretty sweet. He says, uh, grass is still light green, not very dark as it comes through the dressing. Is there something we can use to get darker color? Uh, time, time. So what you're experiencing, James, is that the... The grass, um, it's covered in sand, so you, probably, you may have a little bit of chlorosis, a little bit of um, that settling, setting in because it's, it hasn't been getting very much sunlight. Once it grows through, it's going to darken up. It'll darken through, it'll green up just fine. Like I wouldn't, I really wouldn't sweat it. Like what you're experiencing is completely, is completely normal. Um, what you can do to help speed that up is now that you've top dressed it, if you have a leveling rake and you can just drag the lawn regularly, so not not like put more material down, but just take your leveling rake and literally just walk walk around the lawn with it, that's gonna also that's gonna help the sand to settle a little bit more and also expose the grass blades, which is going to help it you know recover a bit faster. So that's something that you might consider doing if you're not uh, doing that already. And then is um, uh, Jimmy Miller says, "Hey Ron, kind of a dumb hypothetical question." What weed with the Celsius certainty combination not kill? Um, Dallas grass. Dallas grass, mature crabgrass. Um, it's like Celsius will do like young crabgrass. You've got really mature crabgrass. You got to go to something um, stronger like uh, like quinclorac and uh, Dallas grass. Um, I mean, certainty is labeled to suppress it, but really, if you got Dallas grass and you got a residential lawn, just dig it out. There's not really an easy way to get. There's not. There's not a post a good post emergent herbicide for killing Dallas grass on um, on residential lawns. So outside of Dallas grass and really mature crabgrass, it will. It takes care of um, a lot of the common weeds. I'm trying to think of what else. I'm sure there's others, but a lot, what you'll find is outside of Dallas grass and um, and crabgrass, a lot of the the herbis, a lot of the weeds that that those herbicides will not control the you, then you have to start going to something like glyphosate. So, um, so yeah, but as far as common ones that are in, um, that you will find in a residential lawn, Dallas grass is probably the worst one to have because it's not just Celsius uncertainty. There's not really, there's not really anything that you can use on residential lawns, um, that will control it. All right. Uh, next up is Joey Skinner. He says, Ron, my contractor sodded my yard with centipede. It mostly died off last spring. So now my yard is hybrid Bermuda, centipede and Palisades zoysia. Which one would you guess eventually takes over? I don't know. The zoysia or the Bermuda is what I would guess is what I would, um, is what I would imagine. But I, I it's hard, it's hard to say. It's hard to say which one is going to win. Um, my money would be on the zoysia or the Bermuda. Maybe the zoysia with with enough time. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, Joshua uh, Araya says, uh, "Happy Friday, uh, Ron. Scalped the yard yesterday and put down some essential G and stress twelve zero twenty four. Um, tried to use today's rain to my advantage. Nice, nice. Free water is a good thing, right?" And then next up is Leroy Bolden. He says, "I bought a packet of Celsius to treat." 1200 square feet how do i measure and mix oh that's that's a tough one leroy because the these guys the individual packets um this is 0.226 which like the smallest that you just want to you want to spray this on is like 2000 square feet like that's 2000 square feet at the um at the higher rate so i mean i guess what you could do is if you could take the packet contents and empty it out and um and weigh off like half of it. 
I mean, like to take half of it and and put that aside, that's going to get you pretty close to what you would need for right around a thousand square feet. But this assumes this assumes between two thousand and four thousand square feet. So four thousand square feet at the lower rate, or two thousand square feet at the higher rate. Um, so you're gonna you're gonna have to just you have to like pull some of it aside. I mean, I guess you could. Um, let me think about this. It's two point two two six. So you could. Um, get like a cup and put it on a scale, zero the scale and pour half of 0.226, whatever that is. So 0.11 um, into a cup. And that's going to get you pretty close. It's going to get you in the ballpark where you're not going to be over applying it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's what I would do. You're going to have, you're going to have to reduce it because this, that assumes 2000 square feet at the high rate. Uh, so, so hopefully that tip helps you as far as you know, things you can do to, to, um, to figure out how much to use on your, um, on your 1200 square foot lawn. All right. Uh, Noah says, yeah, I'm in Georgia. It looks like three days in the thirties. Yep. And afterwards back up to 40, 55. So I'm inching to put some nitrogen down. Yeah. I mean, you can, I've already done mine, but you can wait if you want to. Like I said, the, we are going to have a slight cold snap, but it's not going to be around for very long. So I really wouldn't, um, wouldn't worry about it, uh, too much. Uh, next up is Dree Hazy says, uh, thoughts on dealing with snow mold damage on perennial ryegrass, soil temp edging around 50 degrees. Um, if it's bad where it's killed off or damaged parts of the lawn, you can, you can overseed those areas that were damaged to recover them. Um, that would be, um, that would be my, my suggestion. I mean, if it's, if snow, snow mold is killed off parts of your lawn, use, um, use some, uh, a blend of, of ryegrass to help, to help recover those, uh, those areas. And as far as soil temps, um, look at, we'll either watch last week's live stream where Devin talks about like the soil temperatures that you want to, to have for, um, for good germination for ryegrass, um, or just look at the bag. The bag will have guidance on it where we'll say, you know, we recommend soil temps be in this area for you to, um, to get good germination with this, with this grass seed blend. So check the label and it'll, it'll, um, it'll get you squared away. All right. Uh, next up is Jason Bickham. He says, Ron, if I just overseeded and top dressed, can I spot spray Celsius on some weeds that are popping up on my lawn? Uh, sure. Yep. Yep. You can do that if you want to. Uh, next is Lawn to Learn. Um, he says, uh, hey, Ron, just want to say hi. I love that you're still here doing this every Friday. Passionate, my man. Uh, yeah, man. I like it. I enjoy it. It is. Um, it is fun. Next up is Mike D. He says, coming in just to say hi, hit the like button. I'll have to catch the replay later on my ride to work tomorrow. Nice. Nice, Mike. It's a, it's a good way to pass the time in the car. I appreciate it. And then next up we have uh, Michael Schroeder. He says, uh, I've got a, I just got the warm season bundle. I have a large area of POA covering about 70%. Um, I am starting to get green up. Should I wait for the heat on the POA or hit it with certainty now during the green up? Depends on how much it bugs you. I mean, if it were me, I would I would get rid of it because the sooner you get rid of the POA annua, um, the, the easier you're going to make for the grass to, like, I imagine you have Bermuda or Zoysia, you, the easier you're going to make it for the grass to, to spread into that area to where it, it can take over. So I would, um, I would get rid of it. I would, I would spray it out. I wouldn't, I personally would not wait, but it's, it's really up to you. And then Michael says, first stream and love your content. I got to catch you lives. Uh, smash that like button. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm glad that you are getting some, uh, some value out of it. Um, cause yeah, cause if you're going to wait for Poe to die off, it could be, it could be two months before it really, really begins dropping away. So, you know, I, it's, it's, again, me, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't, I personally wouldn't wait. Um, next up is Deepak Shamra. He says, is it recommended to core aerate, apply lime, fertilizer, and seed? Please suggest. Uh, yeah, that's a good sequence. So if you need lime, if you need to raise the pH, then doing that after core aeration and doing fertilizer after core aeration and applying seed after core aeration, yeah, those are all, that's a great time to do it. That's a great time to do um, all of those, literally in the order that you recommend, that you suggested. So aerate, lime, fertilizer, and then grass seed. That's a, that's a great, um, you got it, Deepak. Um, great plan. Uh, next up, we have um, Ryan Needon. He says, um, hi, Ron, I have an earthworm infestation in my yard, castings everywhere and tearing up parts of my yard. Any idea? 
Not really, Narayan. I mean, it's, you know, I know that they can be, the, the castings can be a bit of an eyesore, but earthworms are actually a sign of great soil. So I really wouldn't um, try and do, go out there and try and put anything down. I don't even know if you can even buy anything um, for residential lawns that will, that will control earthworms. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't encourage you to do that. I mean, it's, it's like nature's natural aeration. If you are regularly mowing the lawn, every time you mow, you're going to knock them down anyway. So it's, it's, um, I like, I have earthworm castings in my lawn and I don't, I just, the front roller takes care of them. I just roll over them and just go along with my, uh, with my mow. You know, I really wouldn't, um, um, try and, and get rid of them because it's a, again, it's a sign of a healthy lawn, health, sign of healthy soil. Um, we have a super chat. This one is from Fernando. Um, I, let me grab it really quick. Um, Fernando. Super chat. Received. He says, Hey Ron, hope all is well. As you recall, I have some fungus in my zoysia. I am, I'm applying pillar SC again. Do you recommend the same treatment every two weeks? I'll share some videos from last week. Yeah, so um, what I would say, um, Fernando, if you have a disease problem in your lawn, I would, you can use pillar, but if you, I wouldn't do more than two applications of the same fungicide without, until you, before switching to um, a different a different family. So after two applications of pillar, consider going to something like, um, like 336F, uh, I think I've got a link here for you. It's a different, it's a different frat group. So let me, three, three, six, uh, um, let me get, let me get this for you. A link to, to that. And it's actually not that expensive as far as a, as far as fungicides go. So if you've already done, if you do two applications, two in a row, I would then roll to something else. So take a look at that. And, um, again, after this, if you're doing another app, that's fine. But if, if that's still not corrected, which I, I kind of doubt, like pillows are pretty good fungicide. If it's still not corrected, then you know, consider rolling to, um, to that, that product that is linked to you in the, uh, in the chat. Again, thanks for the super chat. Super I do chat. appreciate it. Um, keep me posted, man. Um, I didn't get the video from you. So if you can, actually, you know, I did get the video. Um, I did get the video from earlier in the week and it looked like it was getting better. Um, if you're talking about, if there's another video after that, um, then I haven't seen that, but what you sent me, the, the, the last set of videos that I got from you looks like the lawn was recovering. So, you know, another application of pillar would be, should be all you really need and just let, let, let time um, run its course and the, the, the lawn should heal and grow back in. You know what I mean? So um, uh, that's, again, if, if I'm thinking about the videos that you sent me from, I, I, it may have been last week, um, the, the lawn was recovering um, based on what I, I'd seen. Okay, but again, thank you so much for the super chat. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out or just, you know, shoot me an email with like how it currently looks and we can... Uh, we can assess from there. All right, next up is, it's hardest part figuring out where I left off, is uh, Ken. Um, he says, Ron, can you apply prodiamine and tenacity in the same tank? Cool season mixed with everything. Um, I've never tried that. I don't see, I don't see why you couldn't. I've never tried it though. I've never, I've never, I've, I don't have a cool season lawn, so I've never sprayed tenacity, um, on my lawn. Um, I know you can mix prodiamine with Celsius and certainty and that works fine. I don't know if mixing it with, um, prodiamine, if there's any issues with doing that. Um, I wouldn't think so, but I, I don't know off the, um, off the top of my head, uh, Ken. So I'm not sure if Devin is still in here, if he can chime in on that one, but, um, I'm not, um, I, I don't, Think, I don't think you'd have, you'd have a problem, but I don't, uh, I don't know for sure. All right, next up is Terrence. He says, um, I want to say, he says, good evening, Ron. I wanted to tell you thanks for answering all my questions this week. I am so ready for the season. Thanks again. Finally, let's not forget to hit the like button. Thank you so much, Terrence. You are very, very welcome, sir. I appreciate you watching um, all the content. And then next up is... Uh, Larry, he says, Hey Ron, I started watching since the start and I didn't, and I hit the like, good job. I didn't send pics of the lawn update this week due to work. I am zinc plating parts right now for a 1973 Honda, um, EL or Eggly restoration. Hope to catch up soon. I don't even know what a Honda, what that is. It sounds cool. What is a Honda Eggly? Mm. I gotta, I gotta know. I gotta know now. What is it? Um, oh, it's a bike. Cool. Motorcycle. That's nice. Oh, that's, that is clean. That is cool, man. Very cool. You got to send me pictures once you're all done with it. It'd be cool to check it out. And then, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. and then, um, let's see here. 
Uh, next up is Noek. Um, he says, uh, how can I lower my potassium levels? I've done three soil tests and potassium is always high. I'm using a starter fertilizer. Um, so K is not present slash limited. Thank you for your help. Yeah, if you're trying to lower potassium levels, you don't like don't use a granular fertilizer with potassium in it. Um, if you're using a starter fertilizer, most starter fertilizers have um, a balance have have um, certain amounts of all of them. It's going to have nitrogen, it's going to have phosphorus, and it's going to have potassium. So if you're trying to reduce your potassium levels, I would use. Um, I would use a fertilizer that just doesn't have potassium, at least granular anyway. I would not, I would not use a granular fertilizer with potassium in it if that's what you're trying to do, Noah. So, uh, so yeah, um, the way to lower it is to just not add more. And then, um, and then as far as using, um, Aiden Rekka, as far as using Q4 to burn down an existing lawn, I don't know. I've not, I've not used that. I've not done that to, um, to be able to tell you how well it would work. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that one, unfortunately. I don't know. I'll ask, I'll ask a buddy of mine. I'll ask a buddy of mine about that one. Let me take a... If you want, um, at, and send me an email. It's ron at golfcourselon.com. I'll, I'll ask someone that will know the answer to that, and I will, um, I'll, get it, I'll, I'll get a response for you. Um, da, 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 da. Um, next up, uh, yeah, Braden. I, I don't know if that would work, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, do that. I wouldn't spray it. I wouldn't put that on my lawn. Um, and then next we have Dalvin Larry. He says, Hey Ron, you wouldn't happen to know where I can find a spare quick adapter for the yard mastery sprayer. I hate switching between spray tips and would rather have both options ready to go. Yeah, you can, you can, um, go to flow zones website. Like, uh, I think go to flow zones website. They sell them. Um, if you give me a second here, I might be able to find it for you. Um, but yeah, they, they sell, uh, those adapters, they do. Um, but yeah, if you go there and just look for, look under their access, their accessories, it'll, you'll, you'll find it. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, I got it. Um, yes. Yeah, so if you want like an extra adapter, um, you can get, you can go with this one, Dalvin. That's what you can, um, you can get it there. All right. Um, next up. Um, next up is John Smith. Uh, he says, um, he says, uh, Hey, Hey Ron, I've been watching your program now for approximately four weeks. Whenever I have the time, um, your program is very innovative and, um, very informative and interesting. I'm learning a lot. Keep it up. Cool, John. I appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for taking the time. I'm sorry. I'm not in, in like better spirits than that. I'm kind of, again, I'm fighting off a cold and the, the medicine I'm taking, I can tell it's starting to wear off. <clears throat> so but we must press on, right? Well, you got to keep going. But I'm glad you're finding the content useful. Thank you so much for uh, watching it. Um, next up is Andre Taylor. It's a good question. He says, is it too late to apply pre-emergent in Georgia? I already applied mine and the neighbor sees I have no weeds while they have plenty asked for my suggestion and refer to your website. Is it too late? No. Um, are you going to get as good a result using applying pre-emergent now as if, as if you had done it three weeks ago? Uh, probably not, but it's, I was still, I was still absolutely do it. Like you're still going to be better off. Your neighbors gonna be better off applying pre-emergent than just, um, just letting things go. And, and keep in mind that the weeds that they are seeing now, likely, um, a spring pre-emergent would not have prevented. So the weeds, a lot of the weeds you're seeing in your lawn now, like POA, um, hand bit, like those, those types of weeds, like those likely started germinating months ago. Um, and if they didn't use pre-emergent in the fall, that's why they're seeing it now. So but to, to answer your question, no, it's not too late. I would still apply a, um, a pre-emergent a little bit. It's, it's still, you're still going to get some benefits from it. It's still early enough in the season that you're going to still, um, you're still going to get some results. It's just not going to be as good as if you had done it, say like mid February, given that you're in Georgia. So uh, good question, Andre. Good job helping your, um, your neighbor out. And uh, next up is Michael Schroeder. He says, one more question. I do have Bermuda. I got my prodiamine down early at 50 degrees soil temperatures at the high rate. Should I do one more pre-emergent with dithiopyr this spring or just wait till fall? I would wait until fall. I would not, there should be no need to do dithiopyr again this spring. If you did prodiamine at the, the higher end of the application rate, 
um, you should be good to go. You should you should need to do another pre emergent um, in the springtime. I would wait until the fall. And in the fall, if you have Bermuda, if your budget permits, I would use Spectacle Flow. I wouldn't use the Dithi pair. Spectacle Flow is a much better option for a fall pre emergent on um, on Bermuda than than Prodiamine or or uh, Dimension. So um, so I hope that helps, Michael. <clears throat> He says, D -d -d -d. he says, um, Farrick says, hey, Ron, if you were going with Saad today, which Bermuda would you go with? Also, what is the best way to prepare the ground? Um, I would go with um, probably Tahoma 31. I really like the color of that. So Tahoma 31 or um, Tiff Tough is nice too, but more than likely if I had to pick one, uh, Tahoma 31 is what I would use. And how, how you prepare... Um, get rid of existing weeds, um, do a, a light top dressing with carbonized PN, lay your sod, water it, and wait. And that's how I would go about preparing to install a new sod. All right. Uh, Lance F says, happy Friday, Ron. Yeah, buddy. The t-shirt is awesome. Thank you. You're very welcome. And then um, PS, how'd you come up with your logo? Uh, yeah. So uh, the logo, if you look at it, it's two, it's like, it's like two chats going like opposing each other. So if you look at it, it's like a red chat going from like one direction and then a blue going the other one. So it's, it's like, it kind of symbolizes dialogue or just talking, which I, you know, if you guys look at my YouTube comment section, I try to respond to, to as many comments as I can. So I like to have a lot of dialogue with them, um, with viewers. So there's that. And then the blue triangle is like for the YouTube play button. So it's like, just like the play button is for YouTube because it's like, that's uh, like kind of like part of their logo or kind of like, kind of is like a throw or, or, a, or a nod to YouTube. And then the two, um, the two boxes back and forth are like, you know, we're just, we're just having a dialogue. We're talking, talking about in this case, turf grass. So it's pretty simple. Not, not more, much more complicated than that. Um, uh, uh, next, uh, he says, hey, you told me to identify the weeds and I came to the conclusion that I have a lot of POA. Like POA, I would believe. I would believe that this time of year. And I also think I misidentified the crab grass as barnyard grass. Okay. Um, sounds good. And he says, also, is Spectacle G a good pre-emergent? On the label, it says it prevents crab grass and POANIA, which is one of my big problems. Also, I have Bermuda grass. Yeah, so Spectacle G is a granular version of Spectacle Flow. And um, I, I'm a big fan of Spectacle Flow. I've never used the granular version, but I have no reason to believe that it wouldn't work as well as the liquid. So the thing is, I've never used Spectacle. Um, I, don't, I don't use Spectacle in the springtime. I tend to use it as a fall pre-emergent. So um, it's, your, it's your call whether you want to use it now. In the spring, I am more... Um, more apt to use prodiamine or dithiapyr because really even spectacles, so you use spectacle now, it's not going to do anything for the pre, there's not gonna do much of anything for the POA that's already in your lawn. Like if you're trying to prevent POA with spectacle, the time to do it is to spray it in the fall months, not, not in the spring when it's already here. So if it were me, I would use prodiamine or dithiapyr in the springtime and I would use spectacle as your fall pre-emergent. That is how I would go about it. Um, and then next up is, uh, Jonathan Araya. He says, Hey Ron, what rate do I spray Nutrizolve and the carbon kit for 6,000 square foot lawn? And how many times per month can I spray? Okay. So we'll go backwards. You can spray, um, twice per month. If you're doing spoon feeding, or if you just want to, or if you want to stretch it, you can spray it once per month. I spray twice per month, once every two weeks. Um, as far as the rates, if you're mixing with the carbon kit, Nutrizolve, you would use six ounces per thousand. Um, and then the carbon kit, three ounces per thousand. So say you had the 901C carbon kit, you would use three ounces of um, 901C, three ounces of Nutri-Kelp, six ounces of Nutrizolve, and um, and then a table, a tea, sorry, table, a teaspoon of Biospectrum. So if you're going to spray this in the four-gallon backpack sprayer, take those numbers and multiply them by four. So for Nutrizolve, you would use 24 ounces in four gallons of water. For um, 901C and Nutri-Kelp, you would use 12 ounces in four gallons of water. And then the same thing still applies, a one level teaspoon suspended in water of Biospectrum in four gallons of water, and you're good to go to spray 4,000 square feet, and then just do another mix for another 2,000 square feet. So just take that, the amount of that you, product you applied and cut it in half and spray the remaining 2,000 square feet of your lawn. So hope that helps um, Jaswe Araya. And then uh, next, 
Um, um, next up is, is James Sinner. He says, um, Ron, uh, question. While PGR regulates growth, you've also regulated it to help thicken up lawns. Sounds a bit opposite. Yeah, so what PGR does, a great question, uh, James. What PGR does is it, um, it, it suppresses gibberellic acid synthesis, which is um, which causes stem growth. So it prevents the grass from growing, like this, from stem from growing, but it doesn't prevent it from growing leaf. So I can say this, but an easier way to even is to do is just to show it. So if you look at this, this picture here, this is the product description for Primo Max, and if you go over one, you can see this is. Um, Bermuda without Primo, and this is Bermuda with Primo. So you can see there's less stem, meaning there's less, you know, there's less stalk. It's not going to grow as tall, but there's a lot more leaf. So this is going to produce, you know, in the given the same area, like you look at these pieces of grass, like the one on the right, I think we both agree is thicker than the one on the left. So um, Primo su suppresses top growth or, or, or the grass from growing tall, it suppresses stem growth but it doesn't prevent the grass from, from throwing additional leaf or growing additional leaf, which is what causes it to get thicker. So um, great question. Hopefully that clarifies it for you as far as why of how Primo can prevent the grass from growing tall while still also um, cause it to grow or, or help promote it growing thicker. It's a good, good question. I haven't had that one in a while. Great one, James. And again, you can always go to the product description on the golf course lawn store and take a look at, um, at, Primo, and you'll be able to see that graphic that's there that shows the two grasses, one with Primo and one um, and one without. All right, so um, let me get this here. Get another that. It's a good question, James. All right. Um, next up is Kurt Verdling. He says, "How can I tell what kind of Bermuda grass I have?" Um, if it was installed via sod um, in recent years, Kurt, it's probably Tiffway 419. Um, I don't, I've had this question before and I don't know, I actually don't have a good answer for it. I don't know if extension offices have a service where they can tell you what kind of grass you have, um, if they'll test it. Um, I, I don't, I don't know um, off the top of my head. But if it's, if you live in a subdivision or you had, you know, some service come in and install the sod for you, or if it, was, if it was installed by a sod, more than likely it's going to be a hybrid Bermuda grass and more than likely it's going to be Tifway 419. Um, that is what I imagine is what you are, you're going to have. Um, and then next up we have, um, uh, Quincy says, is there any benefits from adding sulfent, so, uh, I can't, can't talk right now, Sulfentrazone to the same tank and prodiamine for a pre-emergent and post-emergent effect. I my primary weeds are nuts edge, crabgrass, and chamber bitter. Yeah, I mean, I if you're trying to control, like I think that will work for the for the sedges. I don't know so much for the crabgrass and chamber bitter. Um, but to answer your question, Quincy, if can you mix pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides to save time and just spray them at once? In general, yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, as long as the the post-emergent herbicide you're using is labeled to control the weeds you're trying to control, then you can save time by spraying them um, at the at the same time. All right, and then we have a super chat. This one is from Adam uh, Reka. Thank you so much. Super chat. He says, thank you so much for your help and the content. I love to hear you struggle with my name. I'll give you my name and email. Well, if you just type it out, I'm, it's gonna be the same thing. Like, you gotta like, like you get, give me like, like, um, like, like sound it out, like give me like words that I do know how to say so I can say it properly. All right, uh, next up is John um, Milner. He says, hey Ron, uh, Bermuda lawn in central North Carolina. I plan to verticut, aerate, and lawn level mid-April. Would it be best to do all three at once? Is it okay to spread the workout over 30-ish or so days? Um, if it were me, John, I would aerate and do the leveling together. So I would aerate first, like I'd aerate either same day or the day before, and then do your lawn leveling work, and then the verticutting, that can wait until May timeframe if you want. Um, but uh, but the core aeration and leveling, I would do those like at the same time. And verticutting, like I said, you could that could be 30 days later or you know, be late May if you want to. That is how I would do it. 
Um, mm, mm, mm. And then Brian Tanner says, I use Spectacle G this fall and I have a small amount of POA breakthrough. Next year I will be using Spectacle Flow. I will guess I will find out which one works better than the other. Yeah, I mean, the liquid allows you to get more even coverage. So I, I imagine that might work a bit better. Um, but I mean, if you, depends, you say you had some breakthrough, like how much are we talking here? We're talking about a little bit in a few spots. I mean, I would still consider that, um, I would still consider that a win, especially given that for most people applying a granular product, they tend to find that easier than having to mix up liquids. So there is that, Brian. Um, blah, blah, blah. and then next up, um, we have, I just they moved to a new house and they put some bad sod. Um, yes, I'm not sure what you're asking there, fresh apples. Um, uh, next up is, um, is James Sinor. He says, um, Kurt, if I'm in Texas, how many builders will still use text tough, um, 10 Bermuda. It comes from South Texas, Houston area, as well as South Oklahoma. Um, I don't, I don't know, maybe, so that, that could be it too. So there's, so it's some kind of a, some kind of a hybrid, some kind of a hybrid Bermuda um, that James, that Kurt's also telling you about, um, or that James also telling you about uh, Kurt. So it could be that too. Um, so that's the, that's the, so it's, I, I would imagine it's a hybrid of some sort. That's what I would go with. I'd imagine it's a, it's a hybrid of some sort. And then um, next up is um, Cooper24 says, oh, hi, Ron, hope you're well. I am, I am. I mean, I could be a bit better. I'm dealing with, um, dealing with a bit of a cold, but, you know, such is life. Um, and then the last comment of the evening, this one is from Fresh Apple saying, I was asking if it's possible to turn bad sod into good sod or I need to restart or buy good sod. Um, no, no, I mean, what you have is what you have. So you're not like you can go out, you can take an existing sod, an existing lawn and like turn one type of sod into another type of sod. Um, if you don't like it and you just hate the way it looks, you can, you can burn it down, you can kill it off and, and, um, and start over like that. Resodding is that, but you can't like turn Tiffway 419 into Tiff Tough or something like that, if that makes sense. Like what you got is what you got. So uh, there we go. And then, um, our last comment of, um, the evening, he says from Cooper 24, says some areas in my lawn, um, have had heavy snow and now my grass is greening up except for, uh, those areas. Any suggestions? Yeah. So you may have had some damage from the, the snow, uh, Cooper. So in that case, um, you may have to reseed to help recover those, those damaged spots. That, that's really, um, that's the best guidance I can, I can give you. Um, just maybe give it a little bit more time and see what happens. And then again, just use seed if necessary to, to recover those areas that were damaged by the, um, by the snow. All right. Um, and then next up is, um, the last, our last comment in the evening is Michael Schroeder. He says, I want champagne lawn on a bare budget. I have the Scott spreader that gets nitrogen burns and a cheaper backpack sprayer. I have the budget to upgrade one. What do you think is better to upgrade first? The spreader. I would I would do the spreader because the thing is with the sprayer, I mean, unless it's like leaking all over the place, you can make most sprayers work. You can get a pretty good result with most sprayers as long as they're calibrated properly. You can get a pretty good result with them. Um, um, but the spreader, if it's like, it's, if it's cracked or it's like not dispersing fertilizer, or the product you're putting down at the right rates, it can damage the lawn. So I, if of the two, based on what you're describing, um, I would replace the the spreader first. And if you're in the market for a good spreader, um, the Earthway 2050P is uh, the one that I am a fan of. So that is what I, I would go with. So I hope that hope helps, Michael. And if you are looking to pick one up, I'll send you a link here where you can grab it. So at Michael and Schroeder and then Earthway 2050P. And, and on that bombshell, guys, gals, we will cue the outro music because this guy needs to go get some, some NyQuil so I can get rid of this cough and get some sleep. Well, guys, again, guys, gals, thank you guys so much for taking some time out of your Friday night to hang out here on the live stream. Um, hopefully it was useful for you guys, got some value out of it. 
Um, you know, we've got our line of fertilizers, biosimilants are all in stock on the golf course lawn store and shipping. So if you need that, feel free to check it out and stock up for the season to get a lawn that your neighbors are absolutely gonna envy. Thank you guys so much again. Uh, again, appreciate you guys tolerating my scratchy voice with having the cold. And um, oh, one other note, as far as next week's live stream, it's going to be earlier in the week. I have, any, I have a commitment that I, I can't really get out of later on in the week next Friday. So next week's live stream will be on Wednesday, Wednesday night. Wednesday evening is when next week's live stream. I'll make sure I have it scheduled ahead of time so you guys can see that. But um, it'll be Wednesday next week, not Friday. So until then, take care. Have an amazing weekend.